Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you wherever you are in the world, and welcome to The Show Must Go Online. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of The Shakespeare Deck. Every week, a global cast and crew of all levels of experience donate their time and talent freely as part of a mission to create Shakespeare that's for everyone, for free and forever, every Wednesday night. Tonight's reading of All's Well That Ends Well will commence in approximately 15 minutes' time. Please be aware, this play includes a plotline that it hinges on non-consensual sex. This is our 27th show, which means we are now into the countdown of our final 10 performances. That means if you have friends, relatives, colleagues, cohabitors, or indeed perfect strangers that don't yet know about us, please let them know what we have going on here while you still can. We'd massively appreciate it. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, remembering of course to hit the bell icon to receive all notifications, and remember to follow us at TSNG Online live on Twitter or at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. And now to introduce tonight's play brought to us as always by the splendiferous Ben Crystal, it's Dathan B. Williams. Dathan is the Associate Artistic Director and Dramaturge of the Harlem Shakespeare Festival. He taught Introduction to Shakespeare, the Sonnets, at Cornell University and is currently on the adjunct teaching staff at City College of New York. He recently made his off-Broadway uh, off directorial debut with Richie McCall's Step In and Me. His acting credits include the Broadway and First National Tour of Showboat, seven off-Broadway shows, 42 regional theatre companies, including Montclair Shakespeare series, where he played Jake's, Orlando Shakespeare, where he played Touchstone, and two seasons with Canada's Stratford Festival, where he was awarded the Artistic Director's John Hirsch Guthrie Award for Most Promising Young Actor in 1991. Dathan, it's a privilege to have you here with us this evening. The play is All's Well That Ends Well, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rob. In Act Four of All's Well That Ends Well, a French lord notes, the web of life is a mingled yarn, good and ill together. Indeed, today's play is itself a mingled yarn. All's Well That Ends Well is regarded as one of Shakespeare's problem plays, but Aren't all Shakespeare's plays thought to be problem plays to a high school student? However, scholars use the term to refer to the plays issues that cannot be easily identified. They are mainly the comedies that do not arrive at their endings neatly or that tie up the standard happy merit found at the conclusion of comedies in a murky way. The term was coined by critic F.S. Boas. He placed on his list the plays Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and All's Well That Ends Well. Other critics have included The Winter's Tale, Timon of Athens, and The Merchant of Venice. The tone of the plays often shifts between dark psychological drama and more broad, straightforward comic elements. Today, we would call this a dramedy or a tragic comedy. Likely composed and first performed between 1602 and 1605, All's Well That Ends Well does resist categorization because it features elements of comedy, tragedy, and romance. It was inspired by a story from Giovanni Boccaccelli's Decameron, circa 1353. It is possible that Shakespeare read the Italian original, but his chief source was probably the English translation in William Painter's collection, The Palace of Pleasures, 1566 to 67. Scholars have noted that the comedy retains some of the traditional folktale motifs of its source, including the healing of a king and the complication and completion of impossible tasks. As in many of Shakespeare's romantic comedies, the central figure of all's well that ends well is a determined young woman, Helena. In the play, Helena becomes the ward of the Countess of Rosillon after the death of her father, a famous physician. Helen falls hopelessly in love with her son, the pompous Count Bertram. Despite her beauty and worth, Helena has no hope of attracting Bertram because she is of low birth and he is a nobleman. He has been sent to the court of the King of France. However, when word comes that the king is ill, she goes to Paris and using her father's arts, cures the illness, 
a painful fistula on the kings, but in return, she is given the hand of any man in the realm. She chooses Bertram. Her new husband is appalled at the match, however, and shortly after their marriage flees France, accompanied by his friend, the braggart and misanthrope Parales, who, has, who professes his love to Bertram to fight in the army of the Duke of Florence in Italy. Helena is sent home to the Countess and receives a letter from Bertram informing her that he will never be her true spouse unless she can get his family ring from his finger and become pregnant with his child, neither which he declares will ever come to pass. The Countess, who loves Helena and improves of the match, tries to comfort her, but the distraught young woman departs Rosilion, planning to make a religious pilgrimage. Meanwhile, in Florence, Bertram has become a general in the Duke's army. Helena comes to the city and discovers that her husband is trying to seduce the virginal daughter of a kindly widow. With the help of the daughter named Diana, she contrives to trick Bertram. He gives Diana his ring as a token of his love. And when he comes to her room at night, Helena is in the bed and they make love without him realizing that it is her. At the same time, two lords in the army expose Parales as a coward and villain, and he falls out of Bertram's favor. Meanwhile, false messengers have come to the camp bearing words that Helena is dead. And with the war drawing to a close, Bertram decides to return to France. Unknown to him, Helena follows accompanied by Diana and the widow. In Rosilion, everyone is mourning Helena's death. The king is visiting and consents to Bertram marrying the daughter of an old faithful lord named Lafieu. However, he notices a ring on Bertram's finger that formerly belonged to Helena. It was a gift from the king after she saved his life. Helena gave the ring to Diana in Florence, and she in turn gave it to her would-be lover, Bertram. Bertram is at a loss to explain where it came from, but just then Diana and her mother appear to explain matters, followed by Helena, who informs her husband that both his conditions have been fulfilled. Chastised by the king, Bertram consents to be a good husband to her, and there is general rejoicing as all ends well. I played Parolas in a production set on the docks of the Verrazana Museum, Museum and Gardens in Miami, Florida. It is an impeccable reproduction of, a, of an Italian Renaissance villa complete with a gondola. All's well that ends well's popularity on the stage has increased since the second half of the 20th century. I think the problem plays are perfect for our complicated age. My director was interested in the play's treatment of love, redemption and honor, as well as his viewpoint on youth versus old age and the forces of decay and death. We played Parolas as a gay man and Bertram as a young man confused by his sexuality. So how steamy is all's well that ends well? Let's see. The heroine of our play, that would be Helena, tricks a guy into having sex with her so she can have his baby and force him to stay married. Then there's Bertram, Helena's husband, the ultimate love him and leave him kind of guy. His favorite hobby is reducing young naive virgins and making promises he doesn't plan to keep. His best friend, Parales, who spends most of the time talking dirty to girls and giving big ridiculous speeches about why women shouldn't bother trying to hold on to their V cards. You can see why the play has an R rating. Yep, and more than that, we can want to point out, however, that the play's hormone-driven activity hinges on the not-so-sexy situation involving the King of France. Before Helen can marry the man of her dreams and trick him into sleeping with her, she has to travel to Paris, cure a giant abscess, a pus-filled boil, that's been growing on the King's rear end. Yep on a scale of zero to 10, that has a steaminess factor of zero. I want you to enjoy the complications of 
all's wells that ends well. And now back to you, Rob. Thank you so much, Dathan, for sharing your thoughts and experiences on this particularly intriguing and provocative play. And now, Groundlings, the show is about to begin, so please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, post your reactions on social using the hashtag showmustgoonline, and enjoy William Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well. Act 1, Scene 1, Roussillon. Enter young Bertram, Count of Roussillon, his mother, the Countess of Roussillon, and Helena, Lord Lefeu, all in black. In delivering my son from me, I bury a second husband. And I am one man who is dead, and you, you I must attend to his majesty's command to whom I am lord. Find the king a husband, madam. You, sir, a father. What hope is there of his majesty's amendment? He hath abandoned his physicians, madam, and finds no other advantage in the process but only the losing of hope by time. This young gentlewoman had a father. Oh, that had, how sad a passage tis, whose skill was almost as great as his honesty had it stretched so far, would have made nature immortal, and death would have play for lack of work. Would for the king's sake he were living, I think it would be the death of the king's disease. How called you the man you speak of, madam? He was famous, sir, in his profession, and it was his great right to be so, Gerard de Narbon. He was excellent indeed, madam. The king very lately spoke of him admiringly and mourningly. Was this gentleman, the daughter of Gerard de Narbon? His sole child, my lord, and bequeathed to my overlooking. I have hopes of her good that her education promises, her disposition she inherits, which makes fair gifts fairer, for where an unclean mind carries virtuous qualities, their commendations go with pity. In her they are better for their simpleness. She derives her honesty and achieves her goodness. Your commendations, madam, get from her tears. Tis the best brine a maiden can season her praise in. The remembrance of her father never approaches her heart, but the tyranny of her sorrows takes all livelihood from her cheek. No more of this, Helena. Go to no more, lest it be rather thought you affect a sorrow than to have. I do affect a sorrow indeed, but I have it too. Moderate lamentation is the right of the dead. Excessive grief the enemy to the living. If the living be enemy to the grief, the excess makes it soon mortal. Madame. How understand we that? Be thou blessed, Bertram, and succeed thy father in manners as in shape. Thy blood and virtue contend for empire in thee, and thy goodness share with thy birthright. Love all. Trust a few, do wrong to none. Be able for thine enemy rather in power than use, 
and keep thy friend under thine own life's key. Be checked for silence, but never tax for speech. What heaven more will that thee may flourish and my prayers plucked down, fall on my head. Farewell, my lord. It is an unseasoned courtier. Good, my lord, advise him. He cannot want the best that shall attend his love. Heaven bless him. Farewell, Bertram. The best wishes that can be forged in your thoughts be servants to you. Be comfortable to my mother, your mistress, and make much of her. Farewell, pretty lady. You must hold the credit of your father. Oh, were that all? Oh, I think not on my father. And these great tears grace his remembrance more than those I shed for him. What was he like? I have forgot him. My imagination carries no favor in it but Bertram's. Oh, I am undone. There is no living, none, if Bertram be away. Twere all one that I should love a bright particular star and think to wed it. He is so above me. All oh, the ambition in my love thus plagues itself. The hind that must be mated by the lion must die for love. Twas pretty, though a plague, to see him every hour, to sit and draw his arched brows, his hawking eye, his curls in our heart's table, heart too capable of every line and trick of his sweet favor. But now he's gone, and my idolatrous fancy must sanctify his relics. <laughs> Who comes here? Oh, one that goes with him. I love him for his sake, and yet I know him a notorious liar, think him a great way fool, solely a coward. Yet these fixed evils sit so fit in him that they take place when virtue's steely bones looks bleak in the cold winter. Withal, full oft we see cold wisdom waiting on superfluous folly. Save you, fair queen. Oh, and you, monarch. No. And no. Are you meditating on virginity? I. You have some stain of soldier in you. Oh. Let me ask you a question. Man is enemy to virginity. How may we barricade it against him? Keep it out. No, but he assails, and our virginity, though valiant in the defense, yet is weak, unfold some warlike resistance to us. There is none. A man setting down before you will undermine you and blow you up. Bless our poor virginity from underminers and, and blowers up. Is there no military policy how virgins might blow up men? Well, virginity being blown down, man will quicklier be blown up. It is not politic in the commonwealth of nature to preserve virginity. Loss of virginity is rational increase. And there was never virgin got till virginity was first lost. A virginity, by being once lost, may be ten times found. By being ever kept, it is ever lost. Tis too cold a companion. Away with it. I will stand for it a little, though therefore I die a virgin. <sighs> There's little can be said in it. Tis against the rule of nature. To speak on the part of virginity is to accuse your mothers, which is most infallible disobedience. Besides, virginity is peevish, proud, idle, made of self-love, which is the most inhibited sin in the canon. Keep it not. You cannot choose but lose by it. Out with it. Within one year, it will make itself too, which is a goodly increase, and the principle itself not much the worse. Away with it. How might one do, sir, to lose it to her own liking? Let me see. Marry, ill. It is a commodity, will lose the gloss with lying. The longer kept, the less worth. Off with it, while tis vendable. <sighs> Virginity, like an old courtier, wears her cap out of fashion. Richly suited, but unsuitable. Your virginity, your old virginity, is like one of our... French withered pears. 
It looks ill. It eats dryly. Marry, tis a withered pear. It was formerly better. Marry, yet tis a withered pear. Will you anything with it? Not my virginity, yet there shall your master have a thousand loves, a mother and a mistress and a friend, a phoenix, captain and an enemy, a guide, a goddess and a sovereign. Now shall he, I know not what he shall. Oh God, send him well. The court's a learning place and he is one. What one in faith? That I wish well. Tis pity. What's pity? That wishing well had not a body in it which might be felt. That we, the poorer born, whose baser stars do shut us up in wishes, might with effects of them follow our friends and show us what we alone must think, which never returns us thanks. Hmm. Monsieur Corollis, my lord calls for you. Little Helen, farewell. If I can remember thee, I will think of thee at court. Oh, Monsieur Parolis, you were born under a charitable star. Mm, under Mars, I. I especially think under Mars. Why under Mars? The wars hath so kept you under that you must needs be born under Mars. Uh, when he was predominant. No, uh, when he was retrograde, I think rather. Well, I think he's so. You go so much backward when you fight. That's for advantage. So is running away when fear proposes the safety. Oh, but the composition that your valor and fear makes in you is a virtue of a good wing. And I like the wear well. I am so full of businesses, I, I cannot answer thee acutely. Get thee a good husband and use him as he uses thee. So, farewell. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. The faded sky gives us free scope, only doth backward pull our slow designs when we ourselves are dull. Oh, what power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye? The mightiest space in fortune nature brings to join like likes and kiss like native things. <laughs> Impossible be strange attempts to those that weigh their pains in sense and do suppose what hath been cannot be. Whoever strove to show her merit that did miss her love. Uh, the king's disease. My project may deceive me, but my intents are fixed and will not leave me. Exit. Act 1, Scene 2, Paris, the King's Palace. Enter the King of France with letters, lords, and diverse attendants. The Florentines and the Sienese are by the ears, have fought with equal fortune, and continue a braving war. So tis reported, sir. Nay, tis most credible we here receive it a certainty vouched from our cousin Austria with caution that the Florentine will move us for speedy aid wherein our dearest friend prejudicates the business and would seem to have us make denial. <laughs> His love and wisdom approved so to your majesty may plead for amplest credence. He hath armed our answer, and Florence is denied before he comes. Yet, for our gentlemen that mean to see the Tuscan service, freely have they leave to stand on either part. It well may serve a nursery to our gentry who are sick for breathing and exploit. What's he comes here? It is the Count Roussillon, my good lord, uh, young Bertram. Ah. Youth, thou bearest thy father's face. <laughs> Frank nature, rather curious than in haste, hath well composed thee. Thy father's moral parts may thou inherit too. <laughs> Welcome to Paris. My thanks and duty are your majesties. Ah. I would I had that corporal soundness now, as when thy father and myself in friendship first tried our soldiership. He did look far into the service of the time and was discipled of the bravest. He lasted long, but on us both did haggish age steal on and wore us out of act. 
who were below him, he used as creatures of another place and bowed his eminent tops to their low ranks, making them proud of his humility. In their poor praise, he humbled. <laughs> Such a man might be a copy to these younger times, which followed well, would demonstrate them now, but go as backwards. His good remembrance, sir, lies richer in your thoughts than on his tomb. Oh, would I were with him. He would always say, <laughs> methinks I hear him now. <laughs> Let me not live after my flame lacks oil to be the snuff of younger spirits, <laughs> whose apprehensive senses all but new things disdain, whose judgments are mere fathers of their garments, whose constancies expire before their fashions. <laughs> This he wished. I after him do after him wish too. Since I nor wax nor honey can bring home, I quickly were dissolved from my hive to give some laborers room. You are loved, sir. They that least lend it you shall lack you first. I fill a place, I know it. How long did it count since the physician at your father's died? He was much. It was, it was some six months since, my lord. Ah, if he were living, I would try him yet. The rest have worn me out with several applications. Nature and sickness debated at their leisure. <laughs> Welcome, Count. My son's no dearer. Thank your majesty. Exeunt. Act one, scene three, Roussillon. A room in the Count's palace. Enter Countess, Steward Rinaldo, and Clown Labatch. What does this knave here? Get you gone, sirrah. The complaints I have heard of you I do not all believe. Tis my slowness that I do not, for I know you lack not fully to commit them, and have ability enough to make such knaveries yours. Tis not unknown to you, madam. I am a poor fellow. Well, sir. No, madam, tis not so well that I am poor though many of the rich be damned, but if I may have your ladyship's goodwill to go to the world, Isabel, the woman and I, will do as we may. Wilt thou needs be a beggar? I do beg your goodwill in this case. In what case? In Isabel's case and mine own. Service is no heritage, and I think I shall never have the blessing of God till I have issue on my body, for they say bairns are blessings. Tell me thy reason why thou wilt marry. My poor body, madam, requires it. <laughs> I'm driven on by the flesh, and he must needs go that the devil drives. Is this all your worship's reason? Faith, madam, I have other holy reasons. So may, the world, may the world know them. I have been, madam, a wicked creature, as you and all flesh and blood are. And indeed, I do marry that I may repent. <laughs> thy marriage sooner than thy wickedness. I'm out of friends, madam, and I hope to have friends for my wife's sake. Such friends are thine enemies, knave. You're shallow, madam, in great friends, for the knaves come to do that for me, of which I am a weary. He that is my land spares my team and gives me leave to in the crop. If I be his cuckold, he's my drudge. He that comforts my wife is the cherisher of my flesh and blood. He that cherishes my flesh and blood loves my flesh and blood. He that loves my flesh and blood is my friend. Ergo, he that kisses my wife is my friend. <sighs> if men could be contented to be what they are, there were no fear in marriage. Wilt thou ever be a foul-mouthed and calumnious knave? A prophet, I, madam, and uh, I speak the truth. The next way, for I the ballad will repeat, which a men full true shall find. Your marriage comes by destiny. Your cuckoo sings by time. you gone, sir. Gone, sir. I'll talk with you more anon. May it please you, madam, that he bid Helen come to you. Of her I am to speak. Sirrah, tell my gentlewoman I would speak with her. Helen, I mean. We 
Disney's fair face, the cause for tea. Why the Grecian sack at Troy, fond and unfond, with that King Priam's joy. With that she sighed as she stood and gave this sentence of end. Am I not glad if one be good? There's yet one good in What? One good in ten, you corrupt the song, Sarah. One good woman in ten, madam, which is our purifying of the song. One in ten, quoth he. And we might have a good woman born, but every blazing star or an earthquake to amend the lottery well. A man may draw his heart out ere he pluck one. You'll be gone, Sir Knave, and do as I command you. That man should be at woman's command. And yet, no hurt done. I'm going for Zeus. The business is for Helen to come hither. Well, now. I know, madam, you love your gentlewoman entirely. Faith, I do. Her father bequeathed her to me, and she herself, without other advantage, may lawfully make title to as much love as she finds. There is more owing to her than is paid, and more shall be paid to her than she'll demand. Madam. I was very late more near her than I think she'd wish me. Alone she was, and did communicate to herself her own words to her own ears. She thought, I dare vouch for her, they touch no any stranger sense. Her matter was, she loved your son. Fortune, she said, was no goddess that had put such a difference betwixt their two estates. Love no god that would not extend his might, only where qualities were level. This she delivered in the most bitter touch of sorrow that I e'er heard a virgin exclaiming, which I held my duty speedily to equate you with all. You have discharged this honestly. Keep it to yourself. Many likelihoods inform me of this before, which hung so tottering in the balance I could neither believe nor misdoubt. Pray you leave me. Store this in your bosom, and I thank you for your honest care. I will speak with you further anon. Even so it was with me when I was young. If we are ever we are natures, these are ours. This thorn doth our, to our rose of youth rightly belong. Our blood to us, this to our blood is born. It is the show and seal of nature's truth where love's strong passion is impressed in youth. But our remembrance of days foregone, such were our faults, or then we thought them none. Her eye is sickened, I observe her now. What is your pleasure, madam? You know, Helen, I am a mother to you. Mine honorable mistress. Nay, a mother? Why not a mother? When I said a mother, methought you saw a serpent. What's in mother that you start at it? I say I am your mother and put you in the catalog of those that were in womb at mine. Tis often seen adoption strives with nature and choice breeds and natives slip to us from foreign seeds. You ne'er oppress me with a mother's groan, yet I express to you a mother's care. God's mercy, maiden, does it curd thy blood to say I am thy mother? What's the matter? What, this distempered messenger of wet, the many-coloured iris, rounds thine eye? Why, that you are my daughter? That I am not. I say I am your mother. Pardon, madam. The Count Rousseon cannot be my brother. I am from humble, he from honored name. No note upon my parents, his all noble. My master, my dear lord he is, and I his servant live, and will his vassal die? He must not be my brother. Nor I your mother. You are my mother, madam. Would you were, so that my lord your son were not my brother, Indeed, my mother, or were you both our mothers? I care no more for than I do for heaven, so I were not his sister. Can't no other but I, your daughter, he must be my brother? Yes, Helen, you might be my daughter-in-law. God shield, you mean it not. Daughter and mother. So strive upon your pulse. What, pale again? 
my fear catched you in your fondness. Now I see the mystery of your loneliness and find your salt tears head. Now to all sense, tis gross. You love my son for look. Thy cheeks confess it one to the other, and thine eyes see it so grossly shown in thy behaviours that in their kind they speak it. Speak, is it so? If it be so, you have wound a goodly clue. If it be not, forswear it. However, I charge thee, as heaven shall work in me for thine avail, to tell me truly. Good madam, pardon me. Do you love my son? Your pardon, noble mistress. Love you, my son? Do not you love him, madam? Go not about. My love hath interbound, whereof the world takes note. Come, come, disclose the state of your affection. Then I confess, here on my knee, before high heaven and you, I love your son. Oh, my friends were poor, but honest. So is my love. Don't be not offended, for it hurts not him that he is loved of me. I follow him not by any token of presumptuous suit, nor would I have him till I do deserve him, yet never know how that desert should be. I know I love in vain, strive against hope, but let not your hate encounter with my love for loving where you do, but if yourself, whose aged honor cites a virtuous youth, did ever in so true a flame of liking, wish chastely and love Dearly, oh, then give pity to her whose state is such, but cannot choose, but lend and give where she is sure to lose. That seeks not to find that her search implies, but riddle-like lives sweetly where she dies. Had you not lately an intent, speak truly, to go to Paris? Madam, I had. Wherefore, tell true. I will tell truth by grace itself, I swear. You know my father left me some prescriptions of rare and proved effects, and that he willed me in heedfulest reservation to bestow them as notes whose faculties inclusive were more than they were in note. Among the rest, there is a remedy, approved, set down to cure the desperate languishings whereof the king is rendered lost. This was your motive for Paris, was it? Speak. My lord, your son made me to think on this, else Paris and the medicine and the king had from the conversation of my thoughts happily been absent then. I think you, Helen, if you should tender your supposed aid, he would receive it, and he and his physicians are of a mind. He, that they cannot help him, they, that they cannot help. How shall they credit a poor unlearned virgin when the schools emboweled of their doctrine have left off the danger to itself? There's something in it more than my father's skill, which was the greatest of his profession, that his good receipt shall for my, sancti for my legacy be sanctified by the luckiest stars in heaven. And would your honor but give me leave to try success I'd venture the well-lost life of mine on his grace's cure by such a day, an hour. Dost thou believe it? I, madam, knowingly. Why, Helen, thou shalt have my leave and love, means and attendance, and my loving greetings to those of mine in court. I'll stay at home and pray God's blessing unto thy attempt. Be gone tomorrow and be sure of this, what I can help thee to, Thou shalt not miss. Exeunt. Act two, scene one, Paris, the king's palace. Enter the king with diverse young lords taking leave for the Florentine war. Bertram, Count Roussillon and Parolles. Young lords, these warlike principles do not throw from you. And you, lords, farewell. <coughs> Share the advice betwixt you. <laughs> These are our hopes, sir, after well-entered soldiers to return and find your grace in health. No, no, it cannot be. And yet my heart will not confess he owes the malady that doth my life besiege. <laughs> Farewell, young lords. 
Whether I live or die, be you the sons of worthy Frenchmen. Find what you seek, that fame may cry you loud. I say farewell. Health, at your bidding, serve your majesty. Uh, uh, those girls of Italy, take heed of them. They say our French lack language to deny if they demand. <laughs> Beware of being captives before you serve. Uh, Our right. hearts receive your warnings. Farewell. Oh, my sweet lord, that you will stay behind us. But is not his fault, the spark? Oh, tis brave wars. Most admirable. I have seen those wars. I am commanded here and kept a coil with too young and the next year and it is too early. And I mind, stand to it, boy. Steal away, oh. bravely. I shall stay here, the four horse to a smock, creaking my shoes and the plain masonry, till honour be bought up and no sword sworn but the one to dance with. Oh, by heaven, I'll steal away. There's honour in the theft. Committed count. I am your accessory, and so farewell. Oh, I grow to you, and our parting is a tortured body. Farewell, Captain. Sweet Monsieur Perales. The noble heroes, my sword and yours are kin. Good sparks and lustrous, a word, good metals. You shall find in the regiment of the Spini one Captain Spurio with his cicatrice, an emblem of war, here on his sinister cheek. It was this very sword entrenched it. Say to him, I live and observe his reports for me. We shall, noble captain. Mars, doot on you for his novices. <sighs> what will you do? Be the king. Use a more spacious ceremony to the noble lords. You have restrained yourself within the list of too cold and adieu. Be more expressive to them, for they wear themselves in the cap of time after them, and take a more dilated farewell. And I will do so. Uh, worthy fellows, and like to prove most sinewy swordmen. my lord to me and for my tidings i'll see thee to stand up and here's a man stands that has bought his pardon i would you had kneeled my lord to ask me mercy that i may have bid you stand up i would i had so i had broke thy pate and asked thee mercy for it good faith across but my good lord tis thus will you be cured of your infirmity no. Oh, will you eat no grapes, my royal fox? Yes, but you will. My noble grapes, and if my royal fox could reap them. I have seen a medicine that's able to breathe life into a stone, quicken a rock, and make you dance canary with sprightly fire and motion, whose simple touch is powerful to raise King Pippin May to give great Charlemagne a pen in his hand and write to her a love line. What her is this? Why, what is she, my lord? There's one arrived, if you will see her. Now, by my faith and honour, if seriously I may convey my thoughts, in this my light deliverance, I have spoke with one that in her sex, her years, profession, wisdom and constancy hath amazed me more than I dare blame my weakness. Will you see her? For that's her demand, and know her business. That done, laugh well at me. Uh, now, good love you, bring in thy admiration that we with thee may spend our wonder to, or take off thine by wondering how thou tookst it. <laughs> they are fit you, and not be all day, neither. This is his majesty. Say your mind to him. Uh, <clears throat> our fair one, does your business follow us? I, my good lord. Uh, Gerard de Norbonne was my father, in what he did profess, well found. I knew him. Oh, the rather will I spare my praises toward him, knowing him is enough. On's bed of death, many receipts 
he gave me, uh, chiefly oh, one, which as the dearest issue of his practice, he bade me store up dearly uh, as a triple eye safer than mine own two, more dear. I have so, and hearing your high majesty is touched with that malignant cause wherein the honor of my dear father's death and gift stands chief in power, I come to tender it and my appliance with all bound humbleness. We thank you, maiden, but may not be so credulous of cure when our most learned doctors leave us and the congregated college have concluded that laboring art can never ransom nature from her inedible estate. <laughs> I say we must not so stain our judgment or corrupt our hope to prostitute our past cure malady to empirics or to dissever so our great self and our credit to esteem a senseless help when help past sense we deem. My duty then shall pay me for my pains. I will no more enforce mine office on you, humbly entreating from your royal thoughts, uh, a modest one to bear me back again. I cannot give thee less to be called grateful. Thou thoughts to help me and such thanks I give as one near death to those that wish him live. But what it full I know, thou knowest no part. I know in all my peril Thou, no art. What I can do can do no hurt to try, since you set up your rest against remedy. He that of greatest works is finisher, oft does them by the weakest minister. I must not hear thee. Fare thee well, kind maid. Thy pains not used must by thyself be paid. Proffers not took reap thanks for their reward. Inspired merit, so by breath is barred. And most it is presumption in us when the help of heaven we count the act of men. Oh, dear sir, to my endeavors give consent. Of heaven, not me, make an experiment. I am not an impostor that proclaim myself against the level of mine aim, but no, I think and think I know most sure. My art is not past power nor you past cure. Art thou so confident? Within what space hopes thou my cure? The greatest grace, lending grace, ere twice the horses of the sun shall bring their fiery torture, his diurnal ring. Uh. What is infirm from your sound parts shall fly. Health shall live free and sickness freely die. Upon thy certainty and confidence, what darest thou venture? Tax of impudence, a uh, strumpet's boldness, a divulged shame traduced by odious ballads, my maiden's name seared, otherwise, nay, worse of worst, extended with vilest torture, let my life be ended. Methinks in thee some blessed spirit doth speak his powerful sound within an organ weak. Thy life is dear, for all that life can rate, worth name of life in thee hath estimate. Youth, beauty, wisdom, courage, all that happiness and prime can happy call. Thou this to hazard needs must intimate skill infinite, or monstrous desperate. <laughs> ah, sweet practicer. Thy physic I will try. That ministers thine own death if I die. If I break time or flinch in property of what I spoke, unpitied let me die and well deserved. Not helping, death's my fee. But if I help, what do you promise me? Make thy demand. But will you make it even? I, by my scepter and by my hopes of heaven, then shalt thou give me, with thy kingly hand, what husband in thy power I will command. Here is my hand. The premises observed, thy will be, by my performance shall be served. <laughs> give me some help! Oh! <laughs> if thou proceed, 
as high as word. My deed shall match thy meed. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 2, Roussillon, the Count's Palace. Enter Countess and Clown. Come on, sir. I shall now put you to the height of your breeding. I will show myself highly fed and lowly taught. I know my business is but to the court. To the court? Why, what place do you make you special when you put off that with such contempt? But to the court. Truly, madam, if God had lent a man any manners, he may easily put it off at court. He that cannot uh, make a leg, uh, put off cap, kiss his hand, and say nothing, has neither leg, hat, lips, nor cap, and indeed, such a fellow to say precisely, were not for the court. But for me, I have an answer that will serve all men. Mary, that's a bountiful answer that fits all questions. It is like a barber's chair, which fits all buttocks. The pin buttock, the quartz buttock, the burn buttock, or any buttock. Will you answer, sir, fit to all questions? As fit as ten groats is to the hand of an attorney. As your French crown to your taffeta punk, as Tibbs rush for Tom's forefinger, as a pancake for Shrove Tuesday, a Morris for a May Day, as the nail to his hole, the cuckold to his horn, as the nun's lip to the friar's mouth, nay, as the pudding to his skin. Have you, I say, an answer of such fitness for all questions? <laughs> From below your chin to beneath your constable, it will fit any question. Ask me if I am a courtier. It will do you no harm to learn. To be young again, if I, if we could, I will be a fool in question, hoping to be the wiser by your answer. I pray you, sir, are you a courtier? Oh, Lord, sir! More, more, hundred of them. Sir, I am a poor friend of yours that loves you. Oh, Lord, sir! Sick, sick, spare not me. I think, sir, you can eat none of this homely meat. Oh, Lord, sir! Nay, put me to it, I warrant you. I play the noble housewife with time to entertain it so merrily with a fool. Oh, Lord, sir! Why, that serves well again. An end, sir, to your business. Give Helen this. I urge you, I urge her to present an answer back. Commend me to my kinsman and my son. This is not much. Not much commendation to them. Not much employment for you. You understand me? Most fruitfully, I am there before my legs. Haste you again. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 3. Paris, the King's Palace. Enter Count Bertram, Lafeu, and Paramus. They say miracles are past, and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and causeless. Why, it is the rarest argument of wonder that hath shot out in our latter times. Mm, and so it is. To be relinquished of the artists. So I say both of Galen and Paracelsus. Of all the learned and authentic fellows. Right, so I say. That gave him out incurable. Why, that is, so I say too. Not to be helped. Right, as to a, a man assured of a, a uncertain life and sure death. Just, you say well, so would I have said. I may truly say it is a novelty to the world. Nay, it is strange. "'Tis very strange, that is the brief, and the tedious of it, "'and he's of a most fascinorous spirit "'that will not acknowledge it to be the... "'The very hand of heaven. "'Aye, so I say. "'In a most weak and debile minister, "'great power, great transcendence, "'which should indeed give us a further use to be made "'than alone the recovery of the king, as to be... generally thankful. "'I would have said it. <laughs> "'You say well. Oh, 
vinegar. Is not this Helen? For God, I think so. Go call before me all the lords of the court. Fair maid, send forth thine eye. This youthful parcel of bachelors, of noble bachelors, stand at my bestowing, or whom both sovereign power and father's voice I have to use. Thy frank election make, thou hast power to choose, and they none do for <laughs> Oh, to each of you, one fair and virtuous mistress fall when love, please. Mary to each but one. Heaven hath, hath through me restored the king to health. We understand, we understand, we understand it, and heaven thank for heaven you. for it. Ooh, please it, your majesty, I have done already. Uh, the blushes in my cheeks thus whisper me. We blush that thou shouldst choose, but be refused. Let the white death sit on thy cheek forever. We'll ne'er come there again. Make choice and see. Who shuns thy love shuns all his love in me. Now, Diane, from thy altar do I fly, and to imperial love that God most high do my sighs stream. <clears throat> uh, uh, sir, will you hear my suit? And grant it? Uh, thanks, sir. <laughs> All the rest is mute. I had rather be in this choice than throw two aces for my life. Oh, uh... The honor, sir, that flames in your fair eyes before I speak too threateningly replies. Love make your fortunes 20 times above her that so wishes and her humble love. No better, if you please. Hmm. Oh! 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 My wish receive, which great love grant, and so I take my leave. Do all they deny her? Oh, be not afraid that I your hand should take. I'll never do you wrong for your own sake. Blessing upon your vows, and in your bed, find fairer fortune if you ever wed. These boys are boys of ice. They'll none have her. Sure, they are bastards to the English, French, Ned Bottom. You are too young, too happy, and too good to make yourself a son out of my blood. A fair one, think not so. There's one grape left. I dare not say I take you, but I give me and my service ever whilst I live into your guiding power. This is the man. Why then, young Bertram, take her. She's thy wife. My wife, my liege. I shall beseech your highness, in such a business, give me leave to use the help of mine own eyes. Knowst thou not, Bertram, what she has done for me? Yes, my good lord, but never hope to know why I should marry her. Thou knowest she has raised me from my sickly bed. But follows it, my lord, to bring me down must answer for your raising? I know her well. She had her breathing at my father's charge, a, a poor possession's daughter Why, my wife Disdain, rather corrupt me ever. Tis only title thou disdainst in her, the which I can build up. Ah, strange is it that our bloods of color, weight, and heat poured all together would quite confound distinction, yet stands off in differences so mighty. If she be all that is virtuous, save what thou dislikest, a poor physician's daughter, thou dislikest a virtue for the name, but do not so. From Lowest place, when virtuous things proceed, the place is dignified by the doer's deed. Where great additions swell and virtue none, is a, it is a drop seed honor. Good alone is good, without a name. Vileness is so. The property by what it is should go, not by the title. She is young, fair, wise. In these to nature she's immediate heir, and these breed honor. That is honor's scorn, which challenges itself as honor's born, and is not like the sire. Now, what should be said? 
If thou canst like this creature as a maid, I can create the rest. Virtue and she is her own dower. Honor and wealth from me. I cannot love her and nor will strive to do it. Thou wrongst thyself if thou shouldst strive to choose. That you are well restored, my lord, I'm glad. Let the rest go. My honor's at the stake, which to defeat I must produce my power. Here. Take her hand, proud, scornful boy. Unworthy this good gift that doth in vile misprision shackle up my love and her desert. Check thy contempt. Obey our will, which travails in thy good. Do thine own fortunes that obedient right which both thy duty owes and our power claims, or I will throw thee from my care forever into the staggers and the careless lapse of youth and ignorance, both my revenge and hate loosing upon thee in the name of justice without all terms of pity. Oh, speak thine answer. Pardon my gracious Lord, for I submit my fancy to your eyes when I consider what great creation and what dole of honor flies where you bid it, I find that she, which late was in my nobler thoughts most base, is now the praise of the king who so ennobled is as her born soul. Take her by the hand. Tell her she is thine, to whom I promise a counterpoise, if not to thy estate, a balance more replete. I take her hand. Good fortune. And the favor of the king smile upon this contract, whose ceremony shall seem expedient on the now born brief and be performed tonight. As thou lovest her, thy love to me religious, else doth err. I do hear, monsieur, a word with you. Your pleasure, sir. Your lord and master did well to make his recantation. Recantation? My, my lord? My master? Aye, is it not a language I speak? A most harsh one, and not to be understood without bloody succeeding. My master? Are you companion to the Count Rousseau? To any count. To all counts. To what is man? To what is Count's man? Count's master is of another style. You are too old, sir. Let it satisfy you. You are too old. I did think thee, for two ordinaries, to be a pretty wise fellow. Thou didst make tolerable vent of thy travel. It might pass. Yet the scarfs and the bannerets about thee did manifoldly dissuade me from believing thee a vessel of too great a burden. Hadst thou not the privilege of antiquity upon thee? Do not plunge thyself too far in anger, lest thou hasten thy trial. Thy casement I need not open, for I look through thee. Give me thy hand. My lord, you give me most egregious indignity. Aye, with all my heart, thou art worthy of it. <gasps> I'll beat him by my life. If I can meet him with any convenience, and he would double and double a lord, I'll have no more pity of his age than I would have. I'll beat him, and if I could but meet him again. Sirrah, <laughs> your lord and master's married. There's news for you. You have a new mistress. I most unfeignedly beseech your lordship to make some reservation of your wrongs. He is my good lord, whom I serve above, is my master. Who? God? I, sir. The devil it is that's thy master, by mine honour. If I were but two hours younger, I'd beat thee. This is hard and undeserved measure, my lord. Go to, sir. You were beaten in Italy for picking a kernel out of a pomegranate. You are a vagabond and no true traveller. You are more saucy with lords and honourable personages than the commission of your birth and virtue gives you heraldry. You are not worth another word, else I'd call you knave. I leave you. Good. Very good. It is so, then. Good. Very good. Let it be concealed a while. 
Undone and fortified to cares forever. What's the matter, sweetheart? Oh, my Peralis, they have married me. I'll to Tuscan wars and never bed her. France is a dog hole, and it no more merits the tread of a man's foot. To the wars! There's a letter from my mother. What the import is, I know not yet. Aye, that would be known. To the wars, my boy, to the wars! He wears his honour in a box unseen that hugs his kicky-wicky here at home, spending his manly marrow in her arms, which should sustain the bound and high curvet of Mars's fiery steed. To other regions, France is a stable. We, the dwellant, jades. Therefore... To the war! Oh, it shall be so. I'll send her to my house, acquaint my mother with my hate to her, and wherefore I am fled. Write to the king that which I durst not speak. Wars is no strife to the dark house and the detested wife. I'll send her straight away. Tomorrow, I'll to the wars, she to her single sorrow. Why, these balls bound, there's noise in it. <laughs> Tis hard. <laughs> a young man married is a man that's marred. Therefore, away and leave her bravely. Go! The king has done you wrong! <laughs> but hush, tis so. Exeunt. Act two, scene four, another room in the king's palace. Enter Helena and Clown. My mother greets me kindly. Is she well? Truly, she's very well indeed, but for two things. What two things? One, that she's not in heaven with her. God send her quickly. The other, that she's in earth from whence. God send her quickly. Bless you, my fortunate lady. I hope, sir, I have your goodwill to have mine own good fortunes. Oh my knave. How does my old lady? So that you had her wrinkles and I her money, or would she did as you say? Why, I say nothing. Mary, you are the wiser man, for many a man's tongue shakes out his master's undoing. To say nothing, to do nothing, to know nothing, and to have nothing is to be a great part of your title, which is within a very little of nothing. Go to, thou art a witty fool. I have found thee. Did you find me in yourself, sir? Or were you taught to find me? The search, sir, was profitable, and much fool may you find in you, even to the world's pleasure and the increase of laughter. A good knave, in faith, and well fed. <laughs> Madam, my lord will go away tonight. A very serious business calls on him the, the great prerogative and right of love which as your due time claims he does acknowledge but puts it off to a compelled restraint whose want and whose delay is strewed with sweets which they distill now in the curbed time to make the coming hour overflow with joy and pleasure drown the brim what's his will else <laughs> Uh, that you will take your instant leave of the king and make this haste as your own good proceeding, strengthened with what apology you think may make it probable need. What more commands he? That having this obtained, you presently attend his further pleasure. In everything, I wait upon his will. I shall report it so. I pray you. Come, Sarah. Exeunt. Act two, scene five, another room in the king's palace, enter Lefeu and Bertram. But I hope your lordship thinks him not a soldier. Well, yes, my lord, and a very valiant a proof. You have it from his own deliverance. And by other warranted testimony. My dial goes not true. I took this lark for a bunting. I do assure you, my lord, he is very great in knowledge and accordingly valiant have then sinned against his experience and transgressed against his valour. And my state that way is dangerous, since I cannot yet find in my heart to repent. Here he comes. I pray you make us friends. I will pursue the amity. These things shall be done, sir. 
Is she gone to the king? She is. And will she away tonight? As you'll have her. I have written my letters, casketed my treasure, given orders for our horses, and tonight, when I should take possession of the bride, ends ere I do begin. God save you, Captain. Is there any unkindness between my lord and you, monsieur? I know not how I have deserved to run into my lord's displeasure. You have made shift to run into it, boots and spurs and all, like him that leapt into the custard. Would maybe you have mistaken him, my lord? And shall do so ever, though I took him at his prayers. Fare you well, my lord, and believe this of me. There can be no colonel in this light nut. The soul of this man is his clothes. Farewell, monsieur. I have spoken better of you than you have all will to deserve at my hand, but we must do good against evil. An idle lord, I swear. I think so. Why, do you not know him? Yes, I do know him well, and common speech gives him a worthy pass. Oh, here comes my clog. I have, sir, as I was commanded from you, spoke with the king and have procured his leave for present parting. Only he desires some private speech with you. I shall obey his will. You must not marvel, Helen, at my course, which holds not colour with the time, nor does administration and required office in my particulars. Prepared I was not for such a business. Therefore, I am found so much unsettled. This drives me to entreat you that presently you take your way for home, and rather muse than ask why I entreat you, for my respects are better than they seem, and my appointments have in them a need greater than shows itself at first view to you that know them not. This to my mother, it will be two days ere I shall see you, so I leave to you to your wisdom. Oh, sir, I can nothing say but that I am your most obedient servant. Oh, uh, come, come, no more of that. And ever shall, with true observance, seek to eke out that wherein toward me my homely stars have failed to equal my great fortune. Uh, let that go. <laughs> uh, my haste is very great. Farewell. Hi, home. Pray, sir, your pardon. Well, what would you say? I am not worthy of the wealth I owe, nor dare I say tis mine, and yet it is. <laughs> but like a timorous thief, most fain would steal what law does vouch mine own. Well, what would you have? Strangers and foes do sunder and not kiss. Ooh. I pray you say not, but uh, in haste to horse. I shall not break your bidding, good my lord. Where are my other men, monsieur? <laughs> oh, uh, farewell. Oh, go thou towards home, where I will never come, lest I can shake my sword or hear the drum. Away, and for our flight. Bravely, Correggio! Exit. Act 3, Scene 1, Florence, the Duke's Palace, and to the Duke of Florence, the two French Lords. So that from point to point, now you have heard the fundamental reasons of this war, therefore we marvel much our cousin France would in so just a business shut his bosom against our borrowing prayers. Good my lord, the reasons of our state I cannot yield, but like a common and an outward man that the great figure of a council frames by self enable motion. Therefore, dare not say what I think of it. Be it his pleasure. But I am sure the younger of our nature that surfeit on their ease will day by day come here for physic. Welcome shall they be, and all the honors that can fly from us shall on them settle. Tomorrow to the field! Exeunt. Act three, scene two, Roussillon, the Count's Palace. Enter Countess. It hath happened all as I would have had it, save that he comes not along with her. Let me see what he writes and when he means to come. I have sent you a daughter-in-law. She hath recovered the king 
and undone me. I have wedded her, not bedded her, and sworn to make the knot eternal. You shall hear I am run away. Know it before the report come. If there be breadth enough in the world, I will hold a long distance my duty to you, your unfortunate son, Bertram. This is not well, rash and unbridled boy, to fly the favours of so good a king, to pluck his indignation on thy head by the misprising of a maid too virtuous for the contempt of empire. Madam, yonder is heavy news between two soldiers and my young lady. What is the matter? Nay, there is some comfort in the news, some comfort. Your son will not be killed as soon as I thought he would. Why should he be killed? So say I, madam. If he run away, as I hear he does, the danger is in standing to it. That's the loss of men, though it be the getting of children. Here they come, we'll tell you more. Save you, good madam. Uh, madam, my lord is gone, forever gone. Do not say so. Think upon patience, pray you, gentlemen. I have felt so many quirks of joy and grief that the first face of neither on the start can woman unto me. There, where is my son, I pray you? Madam, he's gone to serve the Duke of Florence. We met him thitherward, for thence we came, and after some dispatch in hand at court, thither we bend again. Look on this letter, madam. Here's my passport. When from, when thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then I write a never. This is a dreadful sentence. Brought you this letter, gentlemen? I, madam, and for the content's sake are sorry for our pains. I prithee, lady, have better cheer. If thou engrossest all the griefs are thine, thou robs me of moiety. He was my son, but I do wash his name out of my blood, and thou art all my child. Towards Florence is he? Aye, madam. And to be a soldier? Such is his noble purpose, and belief the duke will lay upon him all the honour that good convenience claims. Return you thither. Aye, madam, with the swiftest wing of speed. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Tis bitter. Find you that there? Aye, madam. Nothing in France until he have no wife. There is nothing here that is too good for him, but only she and she deserves Lord that 20 such rude boys might tend upon and call her hourly mistress. Who was with him? A servant only and a gentleman which I have sometime known. Paroles, was it not? I, my good lady, he. Hmm. A very tainted fellow and full of wickedness. My son corrupts a well-derived nature with his inducement. Indeed, good lady. You're welcome, gentlemen. I will entreat you, when you see my son, to tell him that his sword can never win the honour that he loses. Will you draw near? <laughs> Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Nothing in France until he has no wife. Thou shalt have none, Roussillon. None in France. Then hast thou all again. Poor Lord, is it I that chase thee from thy country and expose those tender limbs of thine to the event of the nun sparing war? And is it I that drive thee from the sport of court where thou wast shot at with fair eyes to be the mark of smoky muskets? Oh, you leaden messengers that ride upon the violent speed of fire, fly with false aim, move the still peering air that stings with piercing, do not touch my lord. Whoever shoots at him, I set him there. Whoever charges on his forward breast, I am the caitiff that do hold him to it, and though I kill him not, I am the cause his death was so affected. Better twere I met the raven lion when he roared with sharp constraint of hunger. Better twere that all the miseries which nature owed were mine at once. No, 
Come thou home, Rusion. Whence honor, but of danger wins a scar, as oft it loses all. I will be gone. <laughs> My being here it is that holds thee hence. Shall I stay here to do it? No, no. Although the air of paradise did fan the house and angels officed all, I will be gone. That pitiful rumor may report my flight to consolate thine ear. Come, night, end day, for with the dark, poor thief, I'll steal away. Exit. Act three, scene three, Florence before the Duke's palace, and to the Duke of Florence, Bertram, Count of Roussillon, Parolles. The general of our horse thou art, and we, great in our hope, lay best our love and credence upon thy promising fortune. Sir. It is a charge too heavy for my strength, but yet we will strive to bear it for your worthy sake to the extreme edge of hazard. Then go forth, and fortune play thy prosperous helm as thy auspicious mistress. This very day, great Mars, I put myself into thy file. Make me but like my thoughts, and I shall prove a lover of thy drum, hater of love. Exeunt Omnes. Act three, scene four, Roussillon, the Count's palace, and to Countess and steward Rinaldo. Alas, and would you take the letter of her? Might you not know she would do as she has done by sending me a letter? Read it again. I am St. Jack's pilgrim thither gone. Ambitious love hath in me offended that barefoot plod I cold ground upon with sainted vow my faults to ha have amended right right that from the bloody cause of war my dearest master your dear son may hie bless him at home in peace whilst i from far his name with zealous flora sanctify he is too good and fair from death and me whom I myself embrace to set him free. Oh, what sharp stings are in her mildest words. Rolando, did you never lack advice so much as letting her pass so? Had I spoke with her, I could have well diverted her intents, which thus she hath prevented. Oh, pardon me, madam, if I had given you this her night, she might have over, over it. Right, right, Rinaldo, to this unworthy husband of his wife. Let every word weigh heavy of her worth, that he does weigh too light. My greatest grief, though little he do feel it, set down sharply. Dispatch the most convenient messenger. When haply he shall hear that she is gone, he will return. And I hope, May, that she, hearing so much, will speed her foot again, led hither by pure love. Which of them both is dearest to me? I have no skill in sense to make distinction. Provide this messenger. My heart is heavy. Mine age is weak. Grief would have tears and sorrow bids me speak. Exeunt. Act three, scene five, without the walls of Florence, and her old widow of Florence, her daughter Diana and Mariana. Oh, nay, come, for if they do approach the city, we shall lose our sight. They say the French Count has done most honourable service. It is reported that he has taken their greatest commander, and with his own hand slew the Duke's brother. <laughs> well, Diana, take heed of this French Earl. The honour of a maid is her name, and no legacy is as rich as history, honesty. I have told my neighbor how you have been solicited by a gentleman, his companion. I know the knave. Hang him! One, Parolus, a filthy officer he is, in those suggestions for the young Earl. Beware of them, Diana, their promises, enticements, oaths, tokens, and all these engines of lust are not the things they go under. I hope I need not advise you further. 
but I hope your own grace will keep you where you are. Though there were no further danger known, but the modesty which is so lost. You shall not need to fear me. I hope so. Look, here comes a pilgrim. I'll question her. God save you, pilgrim. Whither are you bound? To Saint Jacques Le Grand. Where do the Palmers lodge, I do beseech you? At the Saint Francis here beside the port. Oh, uh, is this the way? I marry ist. Hark you to come this way. If you will tarry, holy pilgrim, but till the troops come by, I will conduct you where you shall be lodged. Oh, I thank you and will stay upon your leisure. Uh, you came, I think, from France. I did so. Here, you will see a countryman I, uh, that has done worthy service. His name, I pray you? The Count of Roussillon. Know you such a one? But by the ear that hears most nobly of him, his face I know not. What's a mare he is, he's bravely taken here. He stole from France, as is reported, for the king had married him against his liking. Think you it is so? I surely mere the truth. I know his lady. There is a gentleman that serves the Count, reports but coarsely of her. What's his name? Monsieur Parolis. Oh, I believe with him, in argument of praise, or to the worth of the great Count himself, she is too mean to have her name repeated. Alas, poor lady. Tis a hard bondage to become the wife of a detesting lord. I want good creature, whoe'er soe'er she is, her hard ways sadly. This young maid might do her a shrewd turn if she pleased. How do you mean? Maybe the amorous count solicits her in the unlawful purpose? He does indeed. And broaks with all that can in such a suit corrupt the tender honour of a maid. But she is armed for him and keeps her guard in honestest defense. Oh, oh. Now they come. Oh, oh, which is the Frenchman? He, that with the plume, is not a handsome man. I like him well. Tis pity he is not honest. Yon's that same knave that leads him to these places. Were I his lady, I would poison that vile rascal. But which is he? That jackanapes with scarfs. Why is he melancholy? <laughs> Perchance he's hurt in the battle. Lose our drum! Where? He shrewdly vexed at something. <laughs> he spied us! <laughs> Mary, hang you! And your courtesy for a ring carrier! <sighs> the troops have passed. Come, pilgrim, I will bring you where you shall be host. I humbly thank you. Uh, please it, this matron and this gentle maid to eat with us tonight, the charge and thanking shall be for me. We'll take your offer kindly. Exeunt. Act three, scene six, camp before Florence. Enter Bertram, Count Roussillon, and the two French lords. If your lordship find him not a hilding, hold me no more in your respect. Do you think I am so far deceived in him? He's a most notable coward, an infinite and endless liar, an hourly promise breaker, the owner of no wood good quality worthy your lordship's entertainment. If it were fit you knew him, lest reposing too far in his virtue, which he hath not, he might at some great and trusty business in a main danger fail you. Well, I would, I knew in what particular action to try him. No better than to let him fetch off his drum, which you hear him so confidently undertake to do. I, with a troop of Florentines, will suddenly surprise him, who I'm sure he knows not from the enemy. We will bind and hoodwink him so that he shall suppose no other but that he is carried into the leaguer of the adversaries when we bring him to our own tents. Be but your lordship present at his examination. If he do not, for the promise of his life, and in the highest compulsion of base fear offer to betray you, and deliver all the intelligence in his power against you, and that with the divine forfeit of his soul upon oath, never trust my judgment in anything. Here he comes. <clears throat> How now, monsieur, this drum sticks sorely in your disposition. 
Hawks on. Let it go. Tis but a drum. But a drum. He's but a drum. A drum so lost. There was excellent command to charge in with our horse upon our own wings and to rend our own soldiers. That was not to be blamed in the command of the service. It was a disaster of war that Caesar himself could not have prevented. Oh, well, we cannot greatly condemn our success. Some dishonor we had in the loss of that drum, but it is not to be recovered. It is to be recovered. I would have that drum, or another, or here lies. Why, if you have the stomach to it, monsieur, I will grace the attempt for a worthy exploit. But if you, if you speed well in it, the duke shall speak. The Duke shall both speak of it and extend to you what fervor becomes his greatness, even to the utmost syllable of your worthiness. By the hand of a soldier, I will but undertake you must it. Not slumber in it. Well, about it this evening, by midnight. Look to hear further from me. Well, may I be bold to acquaint his grace you were gone about it? I know not what the success will be, my lord, but the attempt. I vow. Oh, I know thou art valiant, and the possibility of thy shoulder, sh sh shoulder ship will subscribe for thee. Farewell. I love not many words. <laughs> no more than a fish loves water. <laughs> you do not know him, my lord, as we do. Why? Do you think he will make no deed of all this that so seriously he does address himself unto? None in the world, but return with an invention and clap upon you two or three probable lies. He was first smoked by the old Lord Le Fou. When his disguise and he is parted, tell me what a sprat you shall find him, which you shall see this very night. I must go look my twigs. He shall be caught. As please your lordship, I'll leave you. Now, will I lead you to the house and show you the last I spoke of? But you say she's honest. Oh, that's all the fault. I spoke of her but once and found her wondrous cold, but I sent her by the same coxcomb that we have at the wind, tokens and letters which she did resend, and this is all I have done. She is a fair creature. Will you go see her? With all my heart, my lord. Exeunt. Act three, scene seven, Florence, the widow's house, and to Helen and the widow. If you misdoubt me that I am not she, I know not how I shall assure you further, but I shall lose the grounds I work upon. Though my estate be fallen, I was well born, nothing acquainted with these businesses, and would not put my reputation now in any staining act. Nor would I wish you. First, give me trust. The Count, he is my husband, and what to your sworn counsel I have spoken is so from word to word, and then you cannot, by the good aid that I of you shall borrow, err in bestowing it. I should believe you, for you have showed me that which well approves your great and fortune. Take this purse of gold, and <laughs> let me buy your friendly help thus far, which I will overpay, and pay again when I have found it. The Count, he woos your daughter, lays down his wanton siege before her beauty, resolved to carry her. Let her, in fine consent, as will direct her how tis best to bear it. Now his important blood will not deny that she'll demand. A ring the Count he wears, that downward hath succeeded in his house from son to son some four or five descents since the first father wore it. This ring he holds in most rich choice, yet in his idle fire to buy his will, it would not seem too dear, however repented after. Now I see the bottom of your purpose. You see it lawful, then. It is no more, but that your daughter, ere she seems as one, desires this ring, appoints him an encounter, in fine, delivers me to fill the time, herself most chastely absent. After, to marry her, I'll add... 3,000 crowns to what has passed already. I have yielded. Instruct my daughter how she shall persever that time and place with this deceit so lawful may prove coherent. Well, then tonight, let us essay our plot, which, if its speed is 
wicked meaning in a lawful deed and lawful meaning in a lawful act where both not sin and yet a sinful fact. Uh, but let's about it. Exeunt. Act four, scene one, without the Florentine camp. Enter second French lord, first and second soldiers. He can come no other way but by this hedge corner. When you sally upon him, speak what terrible language you will. Though you understand it not yourselves, no matter, for we must not seem to understand him, unless someone among us, whom we must produce for an interpreter. Oh, my lord, let me be good, Captain, let me be the interpreter. Art not acquainted with him? Knows he not thy voice? No, sir, I warrant you. He must think us some band of strangers in the adversary's entertainment. Now, he hath a smack of all neighboring languages. Therefore, we must every one be a man of his own fancy, not to know what we speak one to another. But count, ho, here he comes to beguile two hours in his sleep, and then to return and swear the lies he forges. Mm. Critical. Within these three hours, it will be time enough to go home. What shall I say I've done? It must be a very plausible invention that carries it. They begin to smoke me, and disgraces have of late knocked too often at my door. What the devil should move me to undertake the recovery of this drum, being not ignorant of the impossibility, and knowing I had no such purpose? I must give myself some hurts and say I got them an exploit. <sighs> Yet slight ones will not carry it. They will say, mm, came you off with so little and uh, oh, oh, great ones I dare not give. Wherefore, what's the instance? Tongue, I must prattle you into a butter woman's mouth if you prattle me into these perils. Is it possible he should know what he is and be that he is? I would. The cutting of my garments would serve the turn. Or oh, the breaking of my Spanish sword. We cannot afford you so. Or oh, the, 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 the bearing of my beard and say it was in stratagem. Did not do. Oh, oh no. Or oh, to drown my clothes and say I was stripped. Hardly serve. Though I swore I leapt from the window of the citadel. How deep? Thirty fathom. Three great oaths would scarce make that be believed. I would have had any drum of the enemies. I would swear I recovered it. You shall hear one anon. A drum now of the enemies. Oh, oh, ransom! Ransom! Oh no! Do not hide mine eyes! No! Ah! Oh, 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 oh. I know you are the Muscos Regiment, and I shall lose my life for want of language. Uh, if there be here any German, or Dane, low Dutch, Italian, or French, oh, let him speak to me. I'll, I'll discover that which shall undo the Florentine. Boscos Vauvado, I understand thee, and can speak thy tongue. Kareli Bonto, so betake thee to thy faith, for seventeen poniards are in thy bosom. Oh, oh pray, 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 man carivania dulce. Oscomodocus, volevorco. The general is content to spare thee yet, and hoodwinked as thou art, will lead thee on to gather from thee. Happily thou mayst inform something to save thy life. Oh, let me live. And, and all the secrets of our camp I'll show. Their force, their purposes. Nay, I'll speak that which you will wonder at. But wilt thou faithfully? No, oh, if I do not, damn me. Accordo lenta. Ah. Come on, thou art granted space. Ah. Ah. 
Go tell the Count Rusion and my brother we have caught the woodcock and will keep him muffled till we hear do hear from them. Captain, I will. Exeunt. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, is your five-minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves, and prepare for the second half. And if our lovely crew would like to join us at this time, you're more than welcome. Similarly, Dathan, our fantastic guest introducer, if you'd like to join us for the interval, we'll see whether we can answer a couple of questions from our audience uh, before we get started. Thank you so much. Hi there, Dathan. How are you? How are you? Um, very well, thank you. Yes, having a great time. Having a great time. Uh, just before we get to those interval questions, audience members, do feel free to send those in now. Uh, and we'll try and get them answered for you before the end of the interval. If not, we'll come back to them in the post-show Q&A. Uh, but first, Sarah, do you have an update for us from our Patreon? I do, yes. Uh, so as always, continue thanks to our ongoing supporters on Patreon. Your generosity means so much to everyone involved in the project. Um, I've got a few names to shout out uh, this week. A couple um, of, <laughs> I think there might be usernames, so apologies if I'm mispronouncing. Um, we also have someone who's increased their donation, which is absolutely fantastic as well. Uh, so names to shout out, Lynn W, uh, Café Noir, it, it heard up <laughs> Kirsten, Macaulay G and Alexandra S. So thank you so much to all of those new patrons who have signed up to our uh, project. Um, if you are new to the Show Must Go Online and watching for the first time today, uh, everyone involved in the project does so voluntarily. Uh, so if you would like to tip your actors and creatives, um, then the link to our Patreon is in the video description. Uh, and you can sign up uh, to that um, for as little as you like and are able to give. Um, and in return, you will receive exclusive content on a weekly basis um, put together by our wonderful read page um, you get all sorts of things from exclusive sneak peeks into the forthcoming show we do actor vlogs uh, you get to see uh, through the windows of people around the world so there's lots of lovely stuff on there that you will get exclusive access to Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And of course, uh, if you're enjoying uh, the shows or the series as a whole, uh, you can always get yourself some merchandise from our Redbubble store. You can get a TSMGO branded cup, uh, clock, face mask, uh, which we've uh, modelled a few different variants of this evening already. Uh, so if you would uh, like to get yourself a bit of TSMGO branded merch, you can do that and all proceeds will go into the Patreon opt-in hardship fund as well. Marvellous. So uh, I've got a question here for you, Dathan. Uh, yes. In your introduction, you mentioned different ways of viewing the Helena and Bertram characters and relationship. What is your preferred interpretation? Well, I, I don't have preferred interpretation. I do think that it is a, a, that the play is a particular play about youth, that the incidents that happen are aligned closely, closely aligned to youth and the journey that, that youth takes in settling on exactly where they're going to represent themselves inside of humanity or where they're going to represent themselves inside of life. And I think that's the most fascinating thing about the play itself, that it is a particular youth, a particular look at youth and how that travels and how it unfolds. You have the younger people in the play and you have the older people in, in, in the play. And it's, there's a particular thing about his mother wanting him to be married so that he can continue the line. And that's a big, huge point during that time period about you have to continue the line. We have to have a child, you must get married. So indeed, you know, and the fact that she likes Helena, that, you know, that gives her extra push to say, this is the woman I choose, I am the queen, marry her. You know, and of course, you know, being a very young man, he's like, no, Ma, I don't want the woman you want me to choose. I'm gonna pick my own woman. What's wrong with you? Can I make my own choice? So I think that's kind of the kind of interesting and fascinating thing that you can, you can chart throughout this type of play. I think the wonderful thing is about the problem plays is that all of the characters are not perfect. Everyone in this play has some issue that people do not like. Some people view Helen as being very, very pushy. She's very, she's, she's a reaching above her, her station. She wants to marry up. You know, you have uh, Paparolis who people find they have issues of him. He's a braggart. Indeed, some people can interpret him as being gay. He says he's, he loves 
this young man, he's an older man and he's a younger man. There are those issues. You have what I refer to as the sour clown characters that, that perpetrate throughout the entire play. So you have all of these issues inside of her and you have this king himself who has an issue that has a kind of sexual thing that, that's a connotation that's even linked between him and Helena. You know, so it's a very fascinating thing exactly what, you know, there, it's very murky is exactly what she does to technically cure the actual king. And there are people who said that what she did is she had sex with them. You know, so that's another issue. You can think and be like, oh my God, this play is just really dirty. You know, and there are, and it's full of really just absolutely sexual, dirty jokes throughout the entire thing. And so if you have the commoners in the audience watching, they picked up on all that type of type of humor. And so the comedy of it becomes very, very broad and very, very funny and very topical to what's going on in the time period. I think we sometimes lose that in our modern day translation. We, we lose some of the actual uh, interplay between what the audience recognized and what was going on in that kind of terms of like, I recognize it being a very filthy, funny joke and I'm gonna laugh at it now. So yeah. Those, we actually miss in the course absolutely of i feel like the victorians were to blame for that uh, in a lot of cases because they really kind of censored the plays and really leaned hard away from uh, the kind of filth and the dirty jokes that are present especially in these later plays i can't yes. remember where i saw it but there was a graph of references to sexually transmitted diseases in shakespeare's work and it, and it really cranks up towards the end uh, some people believe that that's a, a suggestion that shakespeare himself had syphilis and was uh, yeah, getting yeah. more and more affected by it as uh, time went on emily i'm jumping in with a fun fascinating fact about shakespeare and the victorians would you like to hear it yes i would there was a, a pamphlet, in fact, there was a series of pamphlets published to instruct young ladies uh, about how they ought to behave. And it was almost like um, the comic books now being like, oh, be like so-and-so. Uh, and it was one of the Shakespearean heroines, um, but they were really baldlerized. Um, Bol William Baldler was a, a, one of the dudes who basically sanitized Shakespeare for the Victorians, like published like really sort of you may have already covered this while I was like off making coffee, uh, but he, he sanitized uh, a lot of versions of Shakespeare. But the, these pamphlets got published saying, oh, be like Isabella, because she's very virginal. Be like Portia, because she's, you know, very, and, and you know, um, all of these pamphlets just got published telling young women that they ought to be like these Shakespearean heroines, but these very sanitized versions. And that's my fascinating fact that I've interrupted with. I'm going to go backstage again. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wonderful Great, interruction, thank Emily. You so thank you so much. And I've got yeah. a quick follow-up question here for you, Dathan, on that. Someone's asked, does Bertram have any redeeming features that might explain <laughs> Helena's devotion to him? Well, the, 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 I think the redeeming feature about him is indeed that if you look at him as being a very, very young man, and you look at, at the journey of what it takes to accept what it is to be a young man in any one society, then you have to give him his ability to make his own mistake, because we all make mistakes. And you certainly have to say that, you know, if I'm going to go along and people are choosing my mates for me, then I have the ability to not accept what you want me to actually do. And that's the kind of things I kind of look at Bertram's journey as to exactly what happens inside of that fascinating for like for 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 youth. And you know, indeed you can even look at Helena and say, you know, she is actually attracted to Bertram because she has the sexual fascination with him and she pursues it to an absolute end that she will get this man and so once again if you look at the two things they're both kind of on the exact same track you know she wants him i'm going to do what i can to get him and he's like i don't want you i'm going to go after the woman that i actually want and if you look at then his ability to be this kind of just this kind of retrobate then you're like oh i get it it's youth youth we make mistakes let him make his mistake and let him grow up because at the end of the play, the king even kind of says that, you know, this kind of all's well that ends well, it's kind of based on how you interpret it and how you make life and how you use what you have in front of you to make life livable. And that's a kind of fascinating thing. You know, the marriage isn't that bad. It is a chosen marriage. And certainly during that time period, you were going to link things in a way that was going to link your lineage up or make things happy or make the end so but this marriage is kind of chosen because she is in a position that both the king and the queen like her and she's being pulled up you know so those are the things that are kind of fascinating i think i think mm. you know I, I don't think he's a he's, he's as bad as we think he is 
I would agree with that. And I think when it comes to having to direct the play, you always want to be able to fight every character's corner so that no one just feels like a kind of two dimensional, um, you know, rubbish human. Uh, and I feel like with Bertram, he's a terrible judge of character. And that gets revealed yeah. to him through his relationship with Parolis. And that, that, lack of ability to judge character comes from a lack of life experience it comes from naivety and so he's easily led he's influenced by Parolis and then once Parolis is revealed to be what he is and mm -hmm. Bertram sees that writ large in front of him not only does he change his opinion of Parolis but he starts to change his opinion of Helena as well and then when he gets back to the court he says well now that I understand that Helena's died I see her through a very different lens than I did before she left um, and so I, th I think Bertram definitely has redeeming qualities. I, th I don't think that stops him from being deeply flawed. Uh, but I think uh, that there are you are within your rights to root for who you want to root for, I suppose, uh, and also uh, take people in the context that they, that they are presented, I suppose. Yeah, and there's also something to be said about when someone dies or you feel that they have died, the, the recognition of the value of them technically shifts and he's kind of in that exact same place of, oh my goodness, I recognize what was actually in front of me and that I did not recognize, and now I do. And I have the ability to forgive. And in forgiveness, I mean, forgiveness is a kind of extraordinary thing. We, we, kind, of, we kind of look at it as being something that's kind of light, but it is an extraordinary thing. And it has to be made from a state of high morality or a state of high moral thing or something that is beyond your concept of where you stand and certainly these problem plays represent that largeness of exactly what that term forgiveness means and how we can actually stand in it so yeah Wonderful. Great note to end on. Thank you so much for that, Dathan. We've now uh, got to head backstage as the second half is about to commence. So uh, if you are enjoying tonight's show, please do like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, post your reactions on social media using the hashtag show must go online. And please enjoy the second half of William Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well. Act 4, Scene 2, Florence, the Widow's House, enter Bertram and the maid called Diana. They told me your name was Fontibel. No, my good lord. Diana? Oh, title goddess, and worth it with addition. But fair soul and your fine frame hath loved no quality. If the quick fire of youth light not your mind, you are no mason but a monument. And now you should be as your mother was when your sweet self was got. She then was honest. Oh, and so should you be. No, my mother did but duty such, my lord, as you owe to your wife. Oh, no more of that. I prithee do not strive against my vows. I was compelled to her, but I love thee by love's own sweet constraint and will forever do thee. All rights of service. Aye, so you serve us till we serve you. But when you have our roses, you barely leave our thorns to prick ourselves and mock us with our bareness. Oh, how have I sworn? It's not the many oaths that makes the truth, but the plain single vow that is vowed true. What is not holy that we swear not by, but take the highest to witness. Therefore, your oaths are words and poor conditions, but unsealed, at least in my opinion. Change it. Change it, be not so wholly cruel. Love is holy in my integrity, never knew the crafts that you do charge men with. Stand no more off, but give thyself unto my sick desires, who then recovers. Say thou art mine, and ever my love as it begins shall so persever. I see that men may rope us in such a snare that we'll forsake ourselves. Give me that ring. Well, I'll lend it thee, my dear, but have no power to give it from me. Will you not, my lord? Well, it is an honour, longing to our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world and me to lose. Mine honour such a ring. My chastity is the jewel of our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world in me to lose. Thus... Your own proper wisdom brings in the champion honour on my part against your vain assault. Oh, here, take the ring, my house, mine honour, yea, my life be thine, and I'll be bid by thee. 
When midnight comes, knock at my chamber window. I'll order take my mother shall not hear. Now will I charge you in the band of truth. When you have conquered my yet maiden bed, remain there but an hour, nor speak to me. My reasons are most strong, and you shall know them when back again this ring shall be delivered. And on your finger in the night I'll put another ring, that what in time proceeds may token to the future our past deeds. Adieu till then, then fail not. You have won a wife of me, though there my hope be done. Heaven on earth, I have won by wooing thee. <sighs> For which live long to thank both heaven and me. My mother told me just how he would woo, as though she sat in his heart. She says all men have the like oaths. He had sworn to marry me when his wife's dead. Therefore, I'll lie with him when I am buried. Since Frenchmen are so braid and marry that will, I live and die a maid. Only in this disguise, I think it no sin to cousin him that would unjustly win. Exit. Act four, scene three, the Florentine camp. Enter the two French lords and first soldier. You have not given him his mother's letter. I have delivered it an hour since. There is something in it that stings his nature, for on the reading it, he changed almost into another man. He has much worthy blame laid upon him for shaking off so good a wife and so sweet a lady. Especially he hath incurred the everlasting displeasure of the king, who had even tuned his bounty to sing happiness to him. I will tell you a thing, but you shall let it dwell darkly with you. When you have spoke, Tis dead, and I am the grave of it. He hath perverted a young gentlewoman here in Florence, of the most chaste renown. And this night he fleshes his will in the spoil of her honor. He hath given her his monumental ring, and thinks himself made in the unchaste composition. Now God delay our rebellion, as we are ourselves, what things we are. We shall not then have his company tonight. Not till after midnight, for he is dieted to his hour. That approaches apace. I would gladly have him see his company anatomized, that he might take a measure of his own judgments, when so curiously he had set this counterfeit. We will not meddle with Peralis till he come, for his presence must be the whip of the other. In the meantime, what hear you of these wars? I hear there is an overture of peace. Nay, I assure you, a peace concluded. What will Count Roussillon do then? Will he travel higher or return again into France? I perceive by this demand you are not altogether of his counsel. Sir, his wife some two months since fled from his house. Her pretense is a pilgrimage to Saint-Jacques-le-Grand, which holy undertaking with most austere sanctimony she accomplished, and there residing... The tenderness of her nature became as a prey to her grief. In fine, made a groan of her last breath. Now she sings in heaven. How is this justified? The stronger part of it by her own letters, which makes her story true, even to the point of her death. Her death itself, which could not be her office to say has come, was faithfully confirmed by the rector of the place. Hath the Count all this intelligence? I. I am heartily sorry that he'll be glad of this. The great dignity that his valor hath here acquired for him shall at home be encountered with a shame as ample. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. Our virtues would be proud if our faults with them not, and our crimes would despair if they were not cherished by our virtues. How now? Where's your master, Bertram? He met the Duke in the street, sir, of whom he hath taken a solemn leave. His lordship will next morning for France. The Duke hath offered him letters of commendation to the king. They shall be no more than needful there if they were more than they can commend. <laughs> they cannot be too sweet for the king's tartness. Here's his lordship now. How now, my lord, is not after midnight? I have tonight dispatched 16 businesses. I have congied with the Duke, done my adwa with his nearest, buried a wife, mourned for her, 
Writ to my lady mother, I am returning, entertain my convoy, and between these main parcels of dispatch, affected many nicer needs. The last was the greatest, but that I have not ended yet. If the business be of any difficulty, and this morning your departure hence, it requires haste of your lordship. I mean the business is not ended as fearing to hear of, of it hereafter. But shall we have the dialogue between the fool and the soldier? Come, bring forth the counterfeit module. He's deceived me like a double-meaning prophesier. Bring him forth. He sat at the stocks all night. Poor gallant knave. Oh, no matter. His heels have deserved it in usurping his spurs so long. How does he carry himself? I have told your lordship already. The stocks carry him. But to answer you as you would be understood, he weeps like a wench that had shed her milk. And what think you he hath confessed? Oh, nothing of me, has he? His confession is taken, and it shall be read to his face. If your lordship be in, as I believe you are, you must have the patience to hear it. Oh, a plague upon him. Muffled? Oh, he can say no, nothing of me. Hush, hush. Goodman comes. <clears throat> Por torta rosa. <laughs> what will you say without them? Well, I will confess what I know without a constraint. If you pinch me like a pasty, I can say no more. Posco chumurcha. Oblibindo, kimi kurburko. You are a merciful general. Our general bids you run, sir, to what I shall ask you out of a note. Oh, and truly, as I hope to live. First, demand of him how many horse the duke is strong. What say you to that? Five or six thousand, but very weak and unserviceable. The troops are all scattered and the commanders very poor rogues. Shall I set your answer so? Do. I'll take the sacrament on it, or, or how and which way you will. <laughs> what a past-saving slave is this? You are deceived, my lord. This is Monsieur Paroles, the gallant militarist, that was his own phrase, that had the whole theory of war in the knot of his scarf and the practice in the shape of his dagger. Oh, five or six thousand horse, I said. I, I will say true, or thereabouts. Sit down, for I'll speak truth. He's very near the truth in this. But I can con, but I con him no thanks for it in the nature he delivers it. Poor rogues, I pray you say. Well, that's set down. I humbly thank you, sir. A truth's a truth. The rogues are marvellous poor. Demand of him of what strength they are approved. What say you to that? By my troth, sir, if I were to live this present hour, I will tell true. Let me see. Uh, Spurio, 150. Uh, Jacques, so many. Gaetan, Cosmo, Lodovic, and Grati, 250 each. Mine own company. <laughs> Christopher, Valmont, Benti, 250 each. So that the muster file, rank and sound upon my life, amounts to not more than 15,000 pole. Uh, half the which shall dare not shake the snow from off their cassette lest they shake themselves to pieces. What shall be done to him? Nothing. Let him have thanks. Uh, demand him my condition and uh, what credit I have with the Duke. Well, that's set down. <sighs> you shall demand of him whether one Captain Domain be in the camp, a Frenchman, what his reputation is with the Duke, what his valour, honesty and expertness in wars, or whether he thinks it were not possible with well-weighing sound of gold to corrupt him to a revolt. What say you to this? What do you think of it? I beseech you to let me answer the particular of the interrogatories. Uh, demand them singly? Do you know this Captain Dumain? I know him. I was a botcher's prentice in Paris, from whence he was whipped for getting the shreves full with child, a damn innocent that could not say him nay. 
<laughs> oh, nay, by your leave, hold your hands. Though I know his brains are forfeited in exile that falls. Well, is this captain in the Duke of Florence's camp? Upon my knowledge, he is. And lousy. Nay, look not so upon me. We shall hear of your lordship soon. What is his reputation with the Duke? The Duke knows him for no other than an poor officer of mine and writ to me the other day to turn him out of the band. I think I have his letter in my pocket. Mary, we'll search. Oh, uh, in good sadness, I, I do not know. Uh, uh, either it is there or it is upon a file with the Duke's other letters in my tent. Here it is. Here's uh, the paper. Shall I read it to you? Well, I do not know if it be it or no. Our interpreter does it well. Excellently. Diane, the Count's a fool and full of gold. That is not the Duke's letter, sir. That is an advertisement to a proper maid in Florence, one Diana, to take heed of the allurement of one Count Roussillon, a foolish idle boy, but for all that, very rottish. And I pray you, sir, put it up again. Nay, I'll read it first, by your favour. What well, 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 my meaning in it, I, I protest, was very honest in the behalf of the maid, for I knew the young Count to be a dangerous and a lascivious boy, who is a whale to virginity and devours up all the fry it finds. Damnable, both sides rogue. When he swears oath, bid him drop gold and take it. After his cause, he never pays the score. And say a soldier, Diane, told you this. Men are to mel with, boys are not to kiss. For count of this, the count's a fool, I know it, who pays before, but not when he does owe it. Thine, as he vow it, do thee in thine ear, Parolis. He shall be whipped through the army with this rhyme in his forehead. This is your devoted friend, sir, the manifold linguist and the omnipotent soldier. I perceive, sir, by the general's look. We shall be fain to hang you. Oh, my life, sir, in any case. Not, not that I am afraid to die, but that my, my offences being many, I would repent out the remainder of nature. Let me live, sir, in a dungeon, in the stocks or anywhere, so I may live. We'll see what may be done, so you confess freely. Therefore, once more to this Captain Domain, you have answered to his reputation with the Duke and to his valour. What is his honesty? He will steal, sir, an egg out of a cloister. <laughs> Uh, he, he, he will lie, sir, with, with such volubility that you would think truth were a fool. <laughs> Drunkenness is his best virtue, for he will be swine drunk. <laughs> I, I have little more to say, sir, of his honesty. <laughs> um, he has everything that an honest man should have, and what an honest man should have, he has nothing. <laughs> I begin to love him for this. For this description of thine honesty. What say you to his expertness in war? Of faith, sir, he's led the drum before the English tragedian. <laughs> to, to belie him I will not, and more of his soldiership I know not. I, I would do the man what honour I can, but of this I am not certain. <laughs> he hath out villainy, villainy so far. That rarity redeems him. A pox on him. His qualities being at this poor price, I need not to ask you if gold will corrupt him to revolt. Well, sir, for a court decoo, he will sell the fee symbol of his salvation, the inheritance of t and and I cut the entail from all remainders, and a perpetual succession for it perpetually. <laughs> what is his brother, the other Captain Domain? Um, uh, Why does he ask him of me? What's he? Uh, he and a crow are the same nest, uh, not altogether so great as the first in goodness, but greater a great deal in evil. <laughs> in a retreat, he outruns any lackey. Uh, <laughs> Mary, in coming on, he has the cramp. <laughs> if your life be saved, 
will you undertake to betray the Florentine? Uh, I, and the captain of his horse, Count Roussillon. I'll whisper with the general and know his pleasure. <sighs> I'll no more drumming. A plague of all drums. Only to seem to deserve well and to beguile the supposition of that lascivious young boy, the Count, have I run into this danger? Yet who would have suspected an ambush where I was taken? There is no remedy, sir, but you must die. The general says you that have so treacherously discovered the secrets of your army and made such vociferous reports of men very nobly held can serve the world for no honest use. Oh. Therefore, you must die. Come, Hesman, oh. off with his head. Oh, Lord, sir, let me live. Oh, let me see my death. That shall you, and take your leave of all your friends. <sighs> so look about you. Know you any here? Good morning, noble captain. God bless you, Captain Parolles. God save you, noble captain. You are undone, captain. All but your scarf. That has a knot on it yet. Who, who cannot be crushed with a plot? Pay you well, sir. I am for France, too. We shall speak of you there. <sighs> yet, yeah. I am thankful. If my heart were great, it would burst at this. Captain, I'll be no more. But I will eat and drink and sleep as soft as Captain May. Simply the thing I am shall make me live. Who knows himself a braggart? Let him fear this, for it will come to pass that every braggart shall be found an ass. Rust sword, cool blushes, <laughs> and Parolles live safest in shame. Being fooled by foolery, thrive. There's place and means for every man alive. Huh. I'll after them. Exit. Act 4, Scene 4, Florence, the Widow's House, enter Helen, Widow, and Diana. That you may well perceive I have not wronged you. One of the greatest in the Christian world shall be my surety. For, uh, for whose throne is needful, ere I can per perfect mine intents, to kneel. <laughs> well, time was... I did him a desired office, dear almost as his life, which gratitude through flinty Tartar's bosom would peep forth and answer thanks. I duly am informed his grace is at Marseille, to which place we have convenient convoy. <laughs> you must know I am supposed dead. The army breaking, my husband hies him home where heaven aiding, and by the leave of my good lord the king, will be before our welcome. <laughs> Gentle madam, you never had such a servant to whose trust your business was more welcome. <laughs> Nor you, mistress, ever a friend whose thoughts more truly labor to recompense your love. <laughs> Doubt not, but heaven hath brought me up to be your daughter's dower as it hath fated her to be my motive and helper to a husband. But, oh, strange men, that can such sweet use make of what they hate, when saucy trusting of the cousined thoughts defiles the pitchy night, so lust doth play with what it loathes, for that which is away. But more of this hereafter. <clears throat> you, Diana, under my poor instructions, yet must suffer something in my behalf. Let death and honesty go of your impositions. I am yours upon your will to suffer. <laughs> yet I pray you, but with the word the time will bring on summer, when briars shall have leaves as well as thorns, and be as sweet as sharp. We must away. Our wagon is prepared, and time revives us. <laughs> 
all's well that ends well. <laughs> Still, the finds the crown. What air the course? The end is the renown. Exeunt. Act four, scene five, Roussillon, the Count's Palace, and to clown, old lady countess and La Fume. No, no, no. Your son was misled with a snipped taffeta fellow there. Your daughter-in-law had been alive at this hour, and your son here at home, more advanced by the king than by that red-tailed humblebee I speak of. I would I had not known him. It was the death of the most virtuous gentlewoman that ever nature had praise for creating. If she had partaken of my flesh and cost me the dearest groans of a mother, I could not have owed her more fruit in love. Was a good lady. Was a good lady. We may take a thousand salads ere we light on such another herb. Indeed, sir. She was the sweet marjoram of the salad, or rather the herb of grace. They are not herbs, you knave. They are nose herbs. I am no great Nebuchadnezzar, sir. I have not much skill in grass. But whether dost thou profess thyself, a knave or a fool? A fool, sir, out of woman's service, a knave. At a man's. I will subscribe for thee. Thou art both knave and fool. At your service. No, no, no. Why, sir, if I cannot serve you, I can serve as great a prince as you are. Who's that? A Frenchman? Faith, sir. He has an English name, but his physiognomy is more hotter in France than there. What prince is that? The Black Prince, sir, alias the Prince of Darkness. Alias. The devil. Go thy ways. I begin to be a weary of thee, and I tell thee so before, because I would not fall out with thee. Go thy ways. Let my horse be well looked to without any tricks. If I put any tricks upon him, sir, they shall be jade tricks, which are their own right by law of nature. A shrewd knave and an unhappy. So he is. My lord that's gone made himself much sport of him. By his authority he remains here, which he thinks is a patent for his sauciness. I like him well, tis not amiss, and I was about to tell you, since I heard of the good lady's death, and that my lord your son was upon his return home, I moved the king, my master, to speak in the behalf of my daughter, which in the minority of them both, his majesty, out of a self-gracious remembrance, did first propose. His highness hath promised me to do it, and to stop up the displeasure he hath conceived against your son. There is no fitter matter. How does your ladyship like it? With very much content, my lord, and I wish it happily affected. His Highness comes post from Marseille of as able body as when he numbered thirty. He will be here tomorrow. It rejoices me that I hope I shall see him ere I die. I have letters that my son will be here tonight. I shall beseech your lordship to remain with me until they meet together. Madam, I was thinking with what manners I might safely be admitted. You need but plead your honourable privilege. Lady, of that I have made a bold charter. But, I thank my God, it holds yet. Oh, madam, yonder's my lord your son with a patch of velvet on his face. Whether there be a scar under it or no, the velvet knows. But tis a goodly patch of velvet. His left cheek is a cheek of a two pile and a half. But his right cheek... It's warm there. A scar nobly got, or a noble scar? Tis a good livery of honour, so the like is that. But it is your carbonado face. Let us go see your son, I pray you. I long to talk with the young noble soldier. Faith, there's a dozen of them, with uh, delicate fine heads, and most courteous feather, which bow their head and nod at every man. <laughs> Exeunt. Act five, scene one, Marseille, a street. Enter Helen, Widow, and Diana. But this succeeding posting day and night must wear your spirits low. We cannot help it. But since you have made the days and nights as one to wear your gentle limbs in my affairs, be bold you do so grow in my requital as nothing can unroot you. In happy time. Oh, this man may help me to his majesty's ear if he would spend his power. God save you, sir. Uh, sir, I have seen you in the court of France. Hmm. 
Sir? I suppose he's been around some time. Hmm. Well, thy lips do move, but I do hear thee not. Hmm. I do presume, sir, that you are not fallen from the report that goes upon your goodness and therefore goaded with most sharp occasions, which lay nice manners by, I put you to the use of your own virtues, for the which I shall continue thankful. Uh, what's your will? That it will please you to give this poor petition to the king and aid me with that store of power you have to come into his presence. The king's not here. Not here, sir. Uh, not indeed. Uh, he hence removed last night, and with more haste than it is his use. Oh, Lord, how we lose our pains. And all's well that ends well yet. Though time seems so adverse and means unfit, I do beseech you, whither is he gone? Uh, marry, as I take it, to Roussillon, whither I am going. I do beseech you, sir, since you are like to see the king before me, commend the paper to his gracious hand, which I presume shall render you no blame, but rather make you think your pains for it. I will come after you with what good speed our means will make us means. This I'll do for you. Ah, and you shall find yourself to be well thanked, what e'er falls more. Well, we must to horse again. Go, go, provide. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 2, Roussillon, before the Count's palace, and to clown Lavatch and Parolis. Good Master Lavatch, give my Lord Lefeu this letter. I have ere now, sir, been better known to you when I have held familiarity with fresher clothes. But I am now, sir, muddied in fortune's mood and smell somewhat strong of her strong displeasure. Truly. Fortune's displeasure is but slattish if it smells so strongly as thou speakst of. Put Nay. And now the wind. Nay, you need not stop your nose, sir. I speak but by a metaphor. Indeed, sir. If your metaphors stink, I will stop my nose. Or against any man's metaphor. Put me. Get thee further. I pray you, sir, deliver me this paper. So. Oh. Prithee, stand away. A paper from Fortune's cloister to give a nobleman. Look, here he comes himself. <laughs> oh, my lord, I am a man whom Fortune hath cruelly scratched. And what would you have me to do? It is too late to pare her nails now. I am for other business. I beseech your honour to hear me one single word. You beg a single penny? Come, you shall hat. My name. Save your word. My name, my good lord, is Parolis. You beg more than word, then? Cox, my passion. Give me your hand. Oh, oh. How does your drum? Oh, my good lord, you were the first that found me. Was I in sooth? And I was the first that lost thee. It lies in you, my lord, to bring me in some grace, for you did bring me out. Out upon thee, knave. Dost thou put upon me at once both the office of God and the devil? One brings thee in grace, and the other brings thee out. King's coming. I know by his trumpets. Sirra, inquire further after me. I had talk of you last night. Though you are a fool and a knave, you shall eat. Go to, follow. I praise God for you. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 3, Roussillon, the Count's Palace, and to King, Old Lady Countess, Le Few, and two French lords, a guard. We lost a jewel of her, and our esteem was made much poorer by it. But your son, as mad in folly, lacked the sense to know her estimation home. Tis past, my liege, and I beseech your majesty to make it natural rebellion, done in the blade of youth, when oil and fire too strong for reason's force, obeys it and burns on. My honoured lady, I have forgiven and forgotten all, though my revenges were high bent upon him, and watched the time to shoot. This I must say, but first I beg my pardon. The young lord, 
uh, did to his majesty, his mother, and his lady offence of mighty note, but to himself the greatest wrong of all. He lost a wife whose beauty did astonish the survey of richest eyes, whose words all ears took captive, whose dear perfection hearts that scorned to serve humbly called mistress. Praising what is lost makes the re remembrance dear. Well, call him hither, we are reconciled. The first view shall kill all repetition. Let him not ask our pardon. Hmm? The nature of his great offense is dead, and deeper than oblivion we do bury the incensing relics of it. Let him approach a stranger, no offender, and inform him so. Tis our will he should. I shall, my liege. What says you to your daughter? Have you spoke? All that he is hath reference to your highness. Then we shall have a match. I have letters sent me that sets him high in fame. He looks well on it. I am not a day of season, for thou mayst see a sunshine and a hail in me at once. But to the brightest beams distracted clouds give way. So stand thou forth. The time is fair again. My high repented blames, dear sovereign. Pardon me. All is whole. Not one word more of the consumed time. Let's take the instant by the forward top. Hmm? For we are old, and on our quickest decrees, the inaudible and noiseless foot of time steals ere we can affect them. You remember the daughter of this lord? Admiringly, my liege, I stuck my choice upon her ere my heart does make too bold a herald of my tongue, where the impression of mine eyes and fixing contempt to scornful perspective did lend me, which warped the line of every other favour, scorned a fair colour or expressed its stolen, extended or contraction all proportions to the most hideous object. Thence it came that she whom all men praised and whom myself, since I have lost, have loved, was in mine eyes the dust that did offend it. Well excused. Thou, that thou didst love her strikes some score away from the great count, but love that comes too late, like a remorseful pardon, slowly carried to the great sender, turns a sour offence, crying, that's good that's gone. Our rash faults make trivial price of serious things we have, not knowing them until we know their grave. Oft our displeasures, to ourselves unjust, destroy our friends, and after weep their dust. Be this sweet Helen's knell, and now forget her. Send forth your amorous token for fair Madeline, the main consents are had, and here we'll stay to see our widower's second marriage day. Which better than the first, O oh dear heaven, bless, or ere they meet in me, O oh nature, cease. Come on, my son, in whom my house's name must be digested. Give a favour from you to sparkle in the spirits of my daughter, that she may quickly come. By my old beard and every hair that's on, Helen was dead, was a sweet creature. Such a ring as this, the last that I, ere I took her leave at court, I saw upon her finger. Hers it was not. Ah. Now pray you let me see it, for mine eye, whilst I was speaking, oft was fastened to it. This ring was mine, and when I gave it Helen, I bade her, if her fortunes ever stood necessity to help, that by this token I would relieve her. Had you that craft to reave her of what should stead her most? My gracious sovereign, however you to Son or on my life. I have what? seen her wear it, and she reckoned it at her life's rate. I am sure I saw her wear it. You are deceived, my lord. She never saw it. In Florence was it from a casement thrown me, wrapped in a paper which contained the name of her that threw it. Noble she was, and thought I stood engaged, but when I had subscribed to mine own fortune and informed her fully, I could not answer in that course of honour, as she had made the overture. She ceased in heavy satisfaction, and would never receive the ring again. T'was mine, t'was Helen's, whoever gave it you. 
And if you know that you are well acquainted with yourself, confess t'was hers, and by what rough enforcement you got it from her. She, she called the saints to surety that she would never put it from her finger unless she gave it to yourself in bed where you have never come, or sent it us upon her great disaster. She never saw it. Thou speak'st it falsely, as I love mine honor, and makest conjectural fears to come into me, which I would fain shut out. If it should, if it should prove that thou art so inhuman, it will not prove so. And yet, I know not. Thou didst hate her deadly, and she is dead, which nothing but to close her eyes myself could win me to believe more than to see this ring. Take him away. We'll sift this matter further. If you shall prove this ring was ever hers, you shall as easy prove that I husbanded her bed in Florence, where yet she never was. I am wrapped in dismal thinkings. Gracious Sovereign, whether a bit to blame or no, I know not. Here's a petition from a Florentine, who hath for four or five removes come short to tender it herself. I undertook it, then encouraged thereto by the fair grace and speech of the poor suppliant, who by this I know is here attending. Upon his many protestations to marry me when his wife was dead, I blush to say it, he won me. Now is the Count Roussillon a widower, his vows are forfeited to me, and my honours paid to him. He stole from Florence, taking no leave, and I follow him to his country for justice. Grant it me, O king, in you it best lies, otherwise a seducer flourishes, and a poor maid is undone. Diana Capulet. I will buy me a son-in-law and a fair and toll for this. I'll none of him. The heavens thought well on thee, the few, to bring forth this discovery. Seek thee these suitors. Go speedily and bring again the count. I am afeard the life of Helen, lady, was foully snatched. Now in justice on the doers. I wonder, sir, Sith wives are monsters to you, and that you fly them as you swear them, lordship, yet you desire to marry. What woman's that? I am, my lord, a wretched Florentine, derived from the ancient Capulet. My suit, as I do understand, you know, and therefore know how far I may be pitied. I am her mother, sir, whose age and honour both suffer under this complaint we bring, and both shall cease without your remedy. Come hither. Count, do you know these women? My lord, I neither can nor will deny but that I know them. Do they each have for her? Why do you look so strange upon your wife? She is none of mine, my lord. If you shall marry, you give away this hand, and that is mine. You give away heaven's vows, and those are mine. You give away myself, which is known mine. But I by vow am so embodied yours that she which marries you must marry me, either both or none. Your reputation comes too short for my daughter. You are no husband for her. My lord, this is a fond and desperate creature whom sometime I have laughed with. Let your highness lay a more noble thought upon mine honour than for you to think I could sink it here. Sir, for my thoughts you have them ill to friend, till your deeds gain them. Fairer prove your honour than in my thought it lies. Good, my lord, ask him upon his oath if he does think he had not my virginity. What sayest thou to her? She is impudent, my lord, and was a common gamester to the camp. He does me wrong, my lord. If I were so, he might have bought me at a common price. Do not believe him. Oh, behold this ring, whose high respect and rich validity did lack a parallel. Yet for all that, he gave it to a commoner of the camp, if I be one. He blushes, and tis hit of six preceding ancestors that gem conferred by testament to the subsequent issue, hath it been owned and sworn. This is his wife that rings a thousand proofs. Methought you said you saw one here in court could witness it. I did, my lord, but loath am I to produce so bad an instrument. His name's Parolis. I saw the man today, if man he be. Find him and bring him hither. Oh, what of him? He's quoted for a most perfidious slave of all the works that washed, whose nakings but to sooth. Am I that or this for what you'll utter? That she hath that ring of yours. Well, I think 
she has. Certainly it says I liked her and boarded her in the wanton way of youth. She knew her distance and did angle for me, madding my eagerness with her restraint. As all impudence and and all impedience and fancy course her motives of more fancy, and then fine her cu infinite cunning, her modern grace subdued me to her rate. She got the inferior might at market price have bought. I must be patient. You that have turned off her first so noble wife may justly die at me. I pray you yet send for your ring. I will return it home and give me mine again. I have it not. What ring was yours, I pray you? Sir, much like the same upon your finger. Know you this ring? This ring was his of late. And this was it I gave him, being a bed. The story then goes false. You threw at him out of a casement. I have spoke the truth. My I do confess in waters. You boggle shrewdly, every feather starts you. Is this the man you speak of? Aye, my lord. Tell me, Sarah, but tell me true, I charge you. By him and by this woman here, what know you? Uh, so please, your majesty, uh, my master hath been an honorable gentleman. A tricks he hath had in him, which gentlemen have. Come to the purpose, did he love this woman? A faith, sir. He did love her, but how? How, I pray you? Why, he did love her, sir, as a gentleman loves a woman. How is that? He loved her, sir, and loved her not. As thou art a knave and no knave, what an equivocal companion is this? I am a poor man, and at your majesty's command. He's a good drum, my lord, a naughty orator. Do you know that he promised me marriage? Faith, I know more than I'll speak. But wilt thou not speak all thou knowest? Yes, so please, your majesty. I did go between them, as I said, but more than that, he loved her. For indeed, he was mad for her. <laughs> Yet I was in that credit with them at that time that I knew of their going to bed and of other motions as promising her marriage and things which would derive me ill will to speak of. Therefore, I will not speak what I know. <laughs> thou hast spoken all already, unless thou canst say they are married. But thou art too fine in thine evidence. Therefore, stand aside. This ring, you say, was yours. Aye, my good lord. Where did you buy it, or who gave it to you? It was not given me, nor I did not buy it. Who lent it you? It was not lent me neither. Where did you find it then? I found it not. If it were yours, by none of these ways, how could you give it him? I never gave it him. This woman's an easy glove, my lord. She goes off and on at pleasure. This ring was mine. I gave it his first wife. It might be yours or hers, for aught I know. Take her away. I do not like her now. To prison with her, and away with him. Unless thou tellst me where thou hadst this ring, thou diest within this hour. I'll never tell you. Well, take her away! I'll put in bail, my liege. I think thee now some common customer. By Jove, if ever I knew man, t'was you. Wherefore hast thou accused him all this while? Because he's guilty. And he is not guilty. He knows I am no maid, and he'll swear to it. I'll swear I am a maid, and he knows not. Great king, I am no strumpet. By my life, I'm either maid or else this old man's wife. She does abuse our ears! To prison with her! Good mother, fetch my bail. Stay, royal sir. The jewel of the toes the ring is sent for, and he shall surety me. But for this lord, who hath abused me as he knows himself, though yet he never harmed me, here I quit him. He knows himself, my bed he hath defiled, and at that time he got his wife with child. Dead though she be, she feels her young one kick. So there's my riddle. One that's dead is quick. And now, behold the meaning. Is there no exorcist beguiles the truer office of mine eyes? Is it real that I see? No, my good lord. Tis but the shadow of a wife you see, the name and not the thing. Both, both, oh. 
Hard and no, my good lord, when I was like this maid, I found you wondrous kind. There's your ring. Oh, and look you, here's your letter. <laughs> ah, this it says. Uh, when from my finger you can get this ring and are by me with child, etc. This is done. Will you be mine now you are doubly one? My liege can make me know this clearly. I love her dearly. Ever, ever dearly. If it appear not plain and prove untrue, deadly divorce step between me and you. Oh, my dear mother, do I see you living? My eyes smell like chips. I shall weep anon. A good chum drum, lend me a handkerchief. Let thy curtsies alone. Oh, they are scurvy ones. Let us from point to point this story know to make the even truth in pleasure flow. If thou beest yet an uncropped flower, choose thou thy husband, and I'll pay thy dower. For I can guess that by thy honest aid thou kept'st a wife herself, thyself a maid. Of that and all the progress, more and less, resolvedly more leisure shall express. All yet seems well, and if it ends so meet the bitter past, more welcome is the sweet. <laughs> The king's a beggar now. Play is done. All is well ended if this suit be one that you express content, which we will pay with strife to please you, day exceeding day. Ours be your patience then, and you, yours, our parts. Your gentle hands lend us and take our hearts. Exit. Congratulations, everybody. Come out here. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. To those of you watching around the world at home, thank you so much for joining us and allow me to introduce you to the cast and crew, starting as always with our amazing producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a writer, director and stage manager based in Edinburgh in Scotland. Our associate producer, Matt Rhodes. Hi, I'm Matthew Rhodes. I'm an emerging theatre artist on unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh territory, also called Vancouver, Canada. And on music and sound, it's Adam Gibson. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a sound designer and composer based in London. And our cast for this evening, as Helena, Sarah Himes. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Himes. I am based in Brooklyn, New York today, and I am an actor, musician, educator extraordinaire. Wonderful. As King of France, Bennett Pology. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben. I'm in New York City. I was the king. I'm a singer, actor, and composer. As Bertram, James Dowood. Hello, everyone. My name is James. I stay in Edinburgh. I'm a performer and actor, um, and I studied musical theatre, so yes. <laughs> As Countess, Lucy Ailey Parker. Hi, I'm Lucy Ailey Parker. I'm an actor, director, singer, voice artist, sometime writer based in West London. As Parolis, Danan McAleer. Hi, I'm an actor. I'm in Bristol, UK, and a gadabout fop. <laughs> As Le Few, Christopher Padden. Hi, I'm Christopher Padden. I'm an actor combatant based in Edinburgh. As Diana Michelle Kelly. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly. I'm an actor and singer based in South Yorkshire. As second French Lord Domain, Stefan Kent. My name is Stefan Kent. I am from Duluth, Minnesota, based in East London, and I'm an actor, musician, sound designer. Wonderful. As Lavatch, Jeff King. Hello, I'm Jeff King. I'm an actor, I'm a singer, and I'm based in Kent. As first French Lord Domain, Witten Frank. That's the super buff first French Lord to you. Uh, I'm an actress based in Los Angeles. I do voice acting. I'm a live VR actor and I also DJ. I have a follow up question on that from our audience when we get to the Q&A. Uh, as widow, Charlotte Harvey. 
Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm an actor in New York City and a video artist also. As first soldier, Olga Blagodatsky. Hello, I'm Olga Blagodatsky. I'm an actor, voiceover artist, dancer, teacher and translator based in Moscow. Wonderful. And I love the ensemble for this evening. Uh, Olive Fanny Gates. Hello, I'm Olive Fanny Gates and I'm from Wales. I'm an actress and a writer and I just graduated from Grey Eye Theatre Company. And Gar K. Lung. Uh, hello, my name is Gar K. I am a PhD student, not an actor at all. Uh, and I also teach philosophy and politics at the University of Warwick. I'm based uh, in Manchester. Fabulous, thank you so much. Ali Pool. Hi, I'm Ali Pool, an actor and sound artist based in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Amazing. And our Valiant Swings for this evening, who in the event of technical difficulties or personal emergencies would have swung in to keep the story moving forward. We had a couple of uh, <laughs> a couple of brief appearances from him tonight. It's Dan Blick. Hi, I'm Dan Blick. I'm an actor and writer based in East London. And Eloise Thompson. Hi, I'm Eloise Thompson. I'm an actress based in West London. Fabulous. Thank you all so much for your efforts today and over the last three days. Really massively appreciate it. Audience members, if you have any questions for our cast and crew, please do send them in now. Uh, we'd love to be able to answer some of those. But I've got a couple left over from the interval. So I'm going to start with this one. Uh, first of all, where is it? Um, there we go. Where do we get tickets to Witten's Gun Show? So over to you, Witten. Uh, um, you know, lots of hard work. I have an amazing trainer who's actually English herself, Jill Penfold. So I have to thank her. I'm not sure if she's watching or not. Um, not to sort of use this, but I do do a VR version of The Tempest on Oculus Quest. So you can get tickets for that through the Under Presents. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Marvellous. Sarah, do we, did we get any other questions at the interval that we didn't manage to get to? Um, so, the, yeah, there was a couple of things that had uh, come up um, that would be good to talk about. So one of them um, was about the aesthetic of the show this week, um, particular props to the amazing hats all round. <laughs> there was a maximum question, I think, where effort, did we get everyone, the hats from? <laughs> the hats are all from the actors, actors' own provided hats. So. Absolutely. If there's any interesting stories. Uh, go for it, Emily. Can I actually highlight in particular Olga's hat, uh, which is actually a, a sun hat masquerading as a tricorn with, I think it was, was it three staples or three stitches, Olga? Do you want to show them? That were three stitches, actually, and the, <laughs> the feather made of the paper. Yeah, but it, it's just a straw sun hat that Olga... Yeah, managed to transform into this glorious tricorn. and I just wanted, to, all of the hats were fantastic, but I just wanted to really shine a spotlight on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it just felt right, this, for this play. You know, it's based in France. There's re references to muskets. Um, and it just, it just seemed like the easiest thing in the world to put this in a kind of musketeer, swashbuckling adventure kind of setting. Uh, and really loved how much people uh, brought it to life. James. Um, I just needed to say a shout out to my friend Elaine, uh, who made this wondrous hat for me as well. Uh, just, I was so happy with it. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Your efforts are very, very much appreciated. Marvelous, love it. Uh, there's a special story behind this this prop. Actually, uh, it was recently given to me, to me by my mum, who saved it for God knows how many years from my own wedding where someone, I think my aunt, made it as a joke. So it's hundreds of years ago, and she just <laughs> gave it to me recently. So it's a, a very a special Amazing. Prop. Sentimental props. We love them. We love them. Oh, fantastic. Uh, also, Ali, did you make that cake? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I stress baked at uh, midnight last night. <laughs> stress at midnight. Oh, my word. <laughs> That's the wrong kind of baked at midnight, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, marvellous. Sarah, do we have any more questions coming in from our lovely audience? Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Stay carried away, dear, oh dear. Um, yes, I've got one that's come through here, uh, which is for our lovely Sarah, Helena. Um, 
uh, first of all, a wonderful, vibrant performance. Um, so this person said, interested to know how or if Helena's opinion changes on Bertram as the play progresses, especially with his behavior in act five. Uh, I think that maybe she's <laughs> she's known Bertram a long time. She's been watching from the side. I'm not sure that she's surprised by anything. I think she's hopeful. I think I think her trajectory is all based on hope, um, at least as far as Bertram's concerned. So uh, I think that she's maybe not surprised, but um, maybe proud of herself and her new girlfriends uh, for their accomplishments and hopeful that it was like a really not great stumbling point to get to where she believes they deserve to be together. I love it. Accentuate the positive. Absolutely. I think dramaturgically, it's um, I think it's essential that um, she's not in the room for a lot of Act Five. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. He's, he gets pretty uh, pinned in the corner there and does some interesting gymnastics to try and get out of it. She just sort yeah. of trusts that it'll work out at the end. She has I to. I just want to briefly ruin another movie for people. So uh, we had a, a brief uh, discussion about this uh, while we were first talking about the show as a whole. Uh, and the fact that if the genders were inverted in this play, it might be uh, looked at very differently. And of course, if that was the case, then Bertram is basically Mulan because he doesn't want to stay in a domestic role uh, bearing children in the home. He wants to go off and join the military. So, you know, you could always look at it that way. <laughs> If, you, if you're trying to find a way to get Bertram off the hook. It's it's problematic on a handful of levels, right? But yeah. I, I like that perspective a lot as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The, there's no escaping really the difficulties that are, um, you know, intrinsic to this play. Uh, we talked about as a, as a kind of content warning at the start of the show the lack of consent, informed consent for Bertram as well. Um, so, you know, if you look at it from that uh, perspective, uh, Bertram, because his is verbalised, I suppose, and it, it's more staged, it's more stage time is taken to show his flaws uh, and his kind of sins, if you like. Um, uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of energy talking about his shortcomings, but at the same time, Helena's device to get to where she wants to go to, viewed in modern context, is pretty bleak as well, unfortunately. Um, it's one of those reasons that this play feels almost like a kind of Oscar Wildean gallop, uh, because if you stop to think too much about anything that's happening, you start to go, mm, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> Dathan, how do you find the ending of this play? Uh, I find the ending of the play to be a, a curious thing. I do like the title. The title is All's Well That Ends Well. And I think you kind of have to take that kind of literally in terms of us you know, most people always think a comedy should end, and, a, and of course, in that classical sense, all of comedies end with a marriage. And so in, in terms of a comedy, it ends with a marriage, but you also have to think of what the title means. You know, all's well that ends well. And indeed, if the means to the end is what was supposed to be achieved, then the ending is actually well ended. And it also, and if indeed, if the overall arc of this is that Bertram must marry to carry on the heritage, then what the circumstances to get him to do so ends well, and therefore my lineage will carry on. So there are kind of really complicated things inside of exactly what that title means and exactly how it all ends up. And indeed, as the uh, King says, you know, you have to, it lands on that if. If, if this ends well, then this will, will follow the thing. So you kind of have to, as you, you kind of have to put into any situation what you want to get out of that situation. And Bertram now has to step forward and put into the marriage what he tried to get out of it from the very beginning. Because Helena has already committed to it in a major way. She's continued to reinvent, continue to recommit to it, to re-exercise, to, re to make sure that it's going to end up the way she wants to. So her journey is some way ahead of Bertram and aren't all women ahead of men? So therefore, here we are with making the man accept this is the journey you're going to go on. Just come with me. 
you know. Brilliant. It was uh, something we talked about um, in our discussions around the production as well, that we wanted the ending to feel more like a beginning, I suppose, like it was the start of a process for the two of them rather than a, a kind of bow on top, happily ever after kind of situation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sarah, do we have any more questions from our audience? Uh, yes. So um, I've got one here, uh, which is how were the filming locations chosen for the show? Um, so was that down to performers or was that the uh, directional perspective from you, Rob? I'm not sure I understand yeah. the question. <laughs> Do you mean in terms of people being in their living rooms? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's where everybody is. Um, I know some online productions choose to use virtual backgrounds. We don't for a number of reasons. Um, and really, for me, it's about shared experience. So if you're in a theater and you're in a space, uh, audience and actors are in the same place. And while people are locked down across the globe, uh, I think it's meaningful to see that all your actors this evening are in the same position that you are um, and that they're staying home and keeping themselves and other people safe uh, as you're doing the same. Uh, and so for me, I think it, it was more about that than anything else, really. It's the, um, it's the Henry V chorus, isn't it? Letters on your imaginary forces work. Um, and it just feels like um, there's a better chance of us doing that if we acknowledge the conceit in the way that the globe would have had, you know, barely any set dressing. You're just told we're in the orchard and you go, cool, fine. Uh, and I think often with online productions, especially if you start going into the virtual space of, of, of trying to make it work, um, you get an uncanny valley effect where things that are like photorealistic can start to trick the brain into thinking that it's actually more weird, more strange, less real. Um, than uh, things that are maybe a bit more illustrative, I suppose. Um, so that's why we do it the way we do. Thank you for your question. Uh, do we have any more, Sarah? Uh, let me just check it. So sure. uh, there was a there was a sort of uh, yeah question that came up earlier about bed tricks, generally, um, and so where else in kind of early modern literature they happen? But it's something that's come up a couple of times in Shakespeare particularly recent ones. Yes, yeah, so we had one in Measure for Measure, didn't we? Yes, uh, then we've had another one here. It uh, se seems to be in vogue right now for whatever reason. Um, I'm afraid as far as early modern literature is concerned, uh, I honestly couldn't speak to that. I don't know, Emily, whether you've got uh, a bit more a broader knowledge of other uses of bed tricks in non-Shakespeare or Dathan, if you're familiar with any, uh, any other bed trick deployments in theatre. Well, I certainly know that some of the bed trick does play into the kind of folktale, and this is indeed based on a folktale. The bed trick, um, the whole journey about the, the saving of the king, those are some of the motifs that occur in that traditional folktale. So it's not something that, that the um, Shakespearean audience would not have been aware of. They would have been aware of that kind of trick that happens inside a folktale. So yeah, I think it's, it's not something that it's kind of odd to us, but it's not odd to the audience for which it was actually written. They would have course, accepted yeah. it as part of the journey that, that we're going on. Oh, it's the bit trick. It's something funny that we all know was going to actually tell. Oh yeah, oh, it's the bit trick. Here we go again. So yeah, I don't think it's, you know, it, it's as unusual as it is for us to actually hear about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Emily? Absolutely. Um, as Dathan says, it would have been fairly common in folklore, um, but it, it's something I don't know terribly much about it during the Elizabethan era and the Jacobean, but certainly during the Restoration period, it continues to be a thing. And it certainly continues to be a thing once you start getting female actors on stage, honestly, for just pervy reasons, like quite, quite gross reasons. But Afro Ben uses it. Um, I'm sure there's other people who do but Afro Ben's the example that sort of immediately springs to mind so certainly it is a thing that there is a history of prior to Shakespeare and continues for a long while after. <laughs> uh, that was a great example of colouring the content of what you're saying with your opinion of it. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Uh, Sarah, do we have any more questions from our audience? Ah, uh, hello. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so someone has asked um, another sort of contextual one. Does this coincide timing wise with the sonnets where he's chiding a beautiful youth for not breeding? Um, I don't think it chimes timing wise, but it certainly chimes theme wise. Um, I think uh, there are several ways. Well, the two chief ways that you can defeat time in Shakespeare's view. One is fame and the other is procreation. And all the fair youth sonnets are talking about 
you can't carry on like this. You've got to procreate. Um, and uh, because, uh, of course, I think, is it the Earl of, which Earl is it? Rochester that it's written to? Henry Woolsey. Um, Earl and, of Southampton. Earl of South. Earl South. of Southampton, thank you so much. Um, and uh, that you can find portraiture of the Earl of Southampton uh, that shows him to be uh, what has been described as effeminate. I suppose he would wear his hair in a way, way that was considered girlish. He would wear makeup a little bit like some of our powdered fops for this evening. Uh, and uh, he was considered uninterested in marriage. And so a lot of the sonnets are there to appeal to him to uh, submit to marriage uh, in order to uh, continue his family line, which is that big theme that uh, you were talking about, Dave. Yeah, yeah, indeed, you know, the um, if the play was indeed constructed around 1602 to 1605, then the Fair Youth sonnets fall in that 1597 to 1603 period. So indeed, you know, you can, if you want to make a personal connection to Shakespeare, that indeed probably these sonnets kind of translate into the story inside of all's well that ends well. And if indeed, you know, during that time where they were being performed in salon like settings, and this is kind of another homage to Southampton, I'm going to actually write a play about you and the journey that you are going on. And therefore, I, I have the sonnets that are you know, that will be passed around personally inside of our community. But I'm also going to construct a play for you to honor you even further and to comment on the journey that you're actually going through. So it's a kind of fascinating thing that's a kind of neat, kind of like inside tale. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it's all kind of hinges on, as I understand it, the, the need for patronage of the arts and the fact that that would come from wealthy nobles who would essentially commission work to an extent. Um, is that correct? Yes. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Nathan. Um, any more questions before we say good night for the evening, Sarah? Um, let me just check. Uh, so I've got one here for, for Dan and actually. Um, that uh, was is a very different character um, from the last one you played with us a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, which do you prefer? No, uh, this one. No, you can't prefer either, right? I mean, that's why you're an actor. You want to be different people. It's it's just joyful though, because you know Bolingbroke's very you know honourable, and yes, of course he's got his flaws, and maybe he's a little liar, really underneath. Maybe he's actually a bit more Parolles than people presume. But um, you know, I love that Parolles just wears it all on his sleeve, and you know, whatever you think of him, he's essentially this character who lives by pleasure. And, you know, who of us hasn't been a coward at some point in his life? You know, there's so much dissing cowards and, oh, you know, he's a coward. We're all cowards, really, naturally, if we're sane. So uh, I do I do have a real soft spot for Parolis because I think maybe he's not misunderstood at all. He's absolutely <laughs> clear cut. Everyone knows exactly who he is by the end. But at the same time, he owns it and he's consistent. So you've got to love that. But, you know, Bolingbroke, he did a solid job as well, to be fair to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Dathan, you played Parolis, uh, I think you said in your introduction. How did you find him as a character? Yes, I did play him. And indeed, um, you know, in our journey when I was talking with um, with our director, our decision to make him into a kind of gay character was kind of indeed kind of linked to my knowledge about the actual sonnets and exactly that whole you know, the whole situation and how this might be a kind of fascinating interpretation. That indeed, if it was something that was inside of the court, that this relationship was being put forward on the stage in a kind of interesting way, that kind of that journey comes through it. I think he's a very fascinating character. I did some research earlier about um, what characters like this represent in Shakespeare's time. And indeed, um, characters that were thought to had that kind of questionable sexuality are kind of villainized. And he, in this play, has a big, huge, everyone puts a big, huge journey of making him kind of like the villain. He's kind of outside of the entire environment. Everything's about that. There's a very fascinating thing, you know, that lines about that, that you outed me when he says, you know, you, you found me out beforehand. And there's a kind of a journey between those two characters, La Fue and Parolis, that kind of have a kind of lineage that someone decides that I'm going to honor who I am and take that journey. And you're going to stay back and hide yourself inside the kind of court and inside the manners to kind of trap you into who you're actually technically going to be. I, you know, and I do find that the journey of them uh, capturing him and hooding him 
and actually in some way torturing him. And if his, you don't know if he's telling lies, if he's making the stories up to actually save himself. And that's a very fascinating thing. I mean, who would not, if you are being tortured, manufacture tells that are going to let, to, to let them let you go. And if you've always been in this journey where someone sees you as an outsider, then your ability to be outside is not going to harm you. And your ability to stand and tell the truth is not going to. And at the end, he tells the truth about Bertram again. He did sleep with her. He did not sleep with her. He tells, he tells the truth. And I think part of Bertram's ability to kind of say, that, oh, my God, he actually reveals who I am. And I'm not happy with that. I'm still not happy with my own journey and my own tell. So I have to separate from him because that's not the way I want to go. So it's a kind of fascinating thing to kind of look at those relations, how they translate and how they kind of play out. Because, you know, he kind of disappears at the end of the play. No one questions where he goes. Everyone else has kind of, but he just disappears. And so why are they once again shedding this character? He just disappears. No one, quite, no one makes those, oh, wh wh where are you going to go? They just leave him be. So is he still going to be part of the society? Or is he going to be executed completely outside? And where does this man go on, on his journey? So it's a kind of a lovely question that kind of, again, we talk about problem plays. That in the conclusion of this play, the question of whether or not things end well is still left for the audience to technically make that decision. Everyone's journey in there ends not well, technically, but how you handle that is the journey you're going to go on. I think that's the beauty about the problem plays. Yeah, it really puts me in mind of, uh, I've been finding as we've been going through the chronology, the, the way Shakespeare toys with audience complicity is really interesting. And the fact that it will get you to laugh at someone up to a point and then it'll flip the switch. And it puts me in mind of Malvolio in, in a dark room and bound uh, in Twelfth Night, when you've seen this absurd character caricature that you suddenly start to sympathize for because um, people go too far with the way that they uh, mistreat him. And it, it feels like there's a parallel there with Parolis, um, yeah. certainly in that scene. Yeah, um, reading a little bit between the lines there, Dathan, uh, you mentioned about Le Few as well, um, and the idea that maybe there's something going on there. Because indeed, he serves a very interesting journey inside of this play. He serves as a kind of comment as he goes, so he's inside the play to make comments and to link things very, very carefully, which means that technically throughout the play, he's always in a place of observing things, not taking place in it, but being outside of it to observe and therefore comment of it. And that's a particular place that you serve in that society and what happens when that's the only place that you know. Mm. And therefore your ability to kind of translate through court by hiding is a significant thing. He's never outside of, and he's never inside of anything. He's always standing on the peripheral mm. of watching things happen. And he only makes the moment of actually standing outside to confront someone completely that is similar to him. That's the, con that, that confrontation scene is very interesting. He's the one person that confronts someone. And why is that decision made that I'm going to confront you and essentially reveal exactly who you are and what I don't like about you being in that position and being able to carry it forward. Mm. Chris, I think you had thoughts on uh, that, the potential of that strand uh, within the few when you were exploring it, didn't you? Yeah, it yeah. was definitely something that we, uh, I think, felt it was good to explore the idea that, well, obviously during the whole process, one of the things you were speaking to us all about was that sort of public persona and private persona thing. And I think Le Few is definitely one of those characters who has a very different public persona where he may be a little affected, but he's, he's very much the sort of um, <clears throat> great man of the court, as it were. Um, and privately, or when he's talking to people where what they say abroad doesn't matter, he perhaps presents a slightly different uh, element to himself. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, that's all we have time for this evening, but thank you all so much for participating in our lovely after show discussion. Uh, if you are interested, we have our next show coming up next week. It's not a big deal. It's just, what is it? Uh, 
King Lear. That's right. We've got King Lear. It's an alumni production featuring actors from this latest season of TSMGO shows. Uh, so we hope that you will join us uh, for that particularly bleak exploration of uh, power, succession, humanity, despair, uh, which is full of uh, incredible language, incredible action, uh, incredible set pieces, all that kind of stuff that we love here at TSMGO. So uh, please do like this video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, please consider tipping your actors by making a donation to the Patreon or indeed uh, by buying some merch on our Redbubble store. And we shall see you next week. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night.